And it's now uh, 631. We have, a, we have a voting quorum here. I want to welcome everybody to the Town of Cohasset Conservation Commission meeting. Today's date is Thursday, August 26th, 2021. It is 631. We are conducting this meeting via Zoom platform. This meeting is being recorded for the record. Uh, the, uh, I will do a roll call attendance here. We do have some new names and faces. And as I sit here, I'm going through the attendees list, making sure we can bring everybody on first. I uh, wanna go through and let everybody know who's on. We have in attendance this evening, we have our new uh, conservation agent, Charlotte Petchtel, which I'll get to in a moment. We have our conservation administrator, Angela Giso. Uh, we also have a town council, Amy Quessel from KP Law in attendance. And voting members uh, in attendance this evening will do this by roll call, uh, just as uh, when I call your name, state your name and just uh, that you're in attendance this evening. Patricia Grady. Here. <laughs> Kathy Berrigan. Kathy Berrigan, present. Eric Eisenhower. Fully present. And uh, Jay Pimpare present this evening as well. Uh, absent this evening is Chris McFarlane, our chair. Uh, as vice chair, I'm going to be chairing this, uh, this meeting tonight. We do have a full, well, we don't have a full, uh, full uh, member here, but we do have a voting uh, quorum of four individuals. Uh, Tom Bell, our associate, is uh, not in attendance at least yet this evening. Uh, we do have Chris McIntyre, one of our associates, who was newly appointed to the, to the uh, Conservation Commission this past Tuesday night as an associate, who is, uh, unfortunately, the town had didn't uh, complete the paperwork to have all of the new members uh, sworn in. I did, so Chris McIntyre is, uh, is, an, is, excuse me, is an associate, but since he was not sworn in in time, unfortunately, he cannot participate in the uh, in the proceedings this evening. I'm waiting on Tom Bell. I have not talked to Tom today as well. We do have a new commissioner, William Ashton. He it will be a full voting member. Again, unfortunately, was not able to get sworn in uh, in time for the meeting tonight. But moving forward, William Ashton will also be a uh, will be a full time uh, voting member. Uh, all right, we'll wait for Tom, but in any event, we do have a full voting member. Hopefully nobody loses a signal. I am in uh, Bar Harbor in some boardroom of a hotel, and hopefully I don't get kicked out of here. Uh, I was going to say I'd turn it over to Eric if I lose power, but if I do, then unfortunately uh, we won't have, have a quorum anyway. Yeah. Hi, Tom. Tom, were you able to uh, get sworn in today at all? No, Angela called me this morning and said that um, Chris had not signed the uh, paperwork. Okay. How okay. About so, what about you, Jay? Uh, no, the my uh, I was not able to get sworn in. So, but I was also not uh, newly elected to, by Tuesday night. They, Tuesday night, the select board delayed my appointment for two weeks. So, I'm still okay. Oh. But as far as proceeding forward, although Tom Bell was voted to become a full-time voting member by the select board this past Tuesday night. Um, I've been told by legal counsel that Tom would need to be sworn in in order to be uh, voted in as a, in order to vote as a full-time voting member tonight. So given that Tom, uh, for another week here or another meeting, unfortunately uh, you're gonna have to just sit on the sidelines and be an associate, but we welcome all of your comments. In any case, congratulations, Tom. Yes. Yeah. Very Welcome exciting. Aboard. We suck to win, Tom. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, so we actually, moving no forward, we will, moving forward at the next uh, meeting, we will have seven full voting members. That's fantastic. And we will have one associate. Great. So we will uh, have, uh, we will be in, in, in great shape. I can and find as you on you have, Yeah. And as you may have heard, we have new town council, KP Law. Uh, is, is in attendance this evening and will awesome. be helping us out with legal issues moving forward. Which brings us to, drum roll please, the introduction of Charlotte Petchtel, our new conservation agent. Hip, hip. And as uh, we welcome you with open arms here, Charlotte, thank you. 
And I just want to okay. give you the floor to say a couple of words if you would like to. Hi, everyone. Uh, yeah, nice to meet all of you virtually. Um, I'm excited to be here and uh, looking forward to working with all of you. This is officially my fourth day. Great. <laughs> wow, that's fantastic. Lots of great changes. Yeah, throwing you right in here in the fourth day. No, that's right. great. So the sooner to... the better. <laughs> yeah. Let's uh, let's get to some business here, and hopefully nobody drops off so we can maintain a quorum. The first item of business is uh, on the agenda tonight is an NOI 21-22. It is for 49 Margin Street. It is for to raise the boathouse and garage. This is a continued hearing from August 12th, 2021. And Megan, if you could please promote uh, Paul Brogna as to a panelist, please. Hi, Paul. And if Paul, if there's, when you come on here, you, 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 Paul, if there's, is there anyone else that you uh, need to be promoted that's gonna speak on behalf of the application tonight? Not at all, Mr. Chair Pro Tem. Uh, I'll be here by okay. myself, and I okay. did speak to Mr. Butler last night, so we're good to go. So. Okay, great. So just to bring everybody up to speed a little bit, this is a continued hearing from August 12th. There were um, some concerns about the, the grading, et cetera, uh, the catch basin. Uh, we did, the, the Conservation Commission did conduct a site visit, and Paul, I'm going to allow you to share your screen here, so get ready. If you want to share your screen at any point in time, that's fine, putting up the site plan. Uh, we did a site visit out there this past Monday at 8.45. Uh, there were several commissioners that were in attendance that did walk the, walk the property out there. Uh, Paul gave us a nice little overview. Uh, of, of the of the layout and talked about the revised plans, et cetera. I do want to mention to the public if there is anyone that is an attendee that was that has a question this evening, uh, just put that in the Q and A at the bottom of your screen. You'll see the Q and A box. Uh, please state your name and your address for the record, please, uh, so that the question can be entered into the record. We will address all of the questions live. And if needed, we will promote you to a panelist in the event that we feel that there needs to be some further discussion. So again, please use the Q&A box for the general public. Um, I do see you sharing a screen here, Paul, that's great. Uh, for the record, please, Paul, could you just state your, your name and your affiliation to the project? And then just uh, uh, please give us a, a brief overview of, of where we left off from last week, changes sure. that have been made, and we'll we'll go from there. And if you could blow this up a little bit too, Paul, that would be great. Yeah, right in the the yeah. You could just blow that up a little bit. Not allowing you to do it that way, is it? No. Is there an alternate way, Justin? <laughs> um, well, just uh, I think we're all familiar with the project, but why don't you just go with what you have for the time being? Okay. Uh, we met two weeks ago this evening. We presented our project, and for those that uh, were not here, uh, I'll spend a minute or so just giving a little bit of a history as to what we presented uh, two weeks ago. Uh, the questions from the commissioners and the uh, public at that point in time. But for the record, I'm Paul Drogner. I'm the, uh, the owner of Seacoast Engineering in Duxbury and uh, been retained by the Butler family at 49 Margin Street to prepare the plans and the filing for, for the Butlers to basically raise their, their three-car garage and their boathouse that you see in the middle of the plan uh, up out of the flood zone about three and a half feet higher than where they are today. Uh, we did the initial filing, as I said, uh, a few weeks ago, we had the meeting two weeks ago, and a few questions relative to the amount of topography on the nine acre parcel. Uh, and one of the questions from two weeks ago with the continued hearing was to go back out and basically acquire some more uh, engineering topographic information, revise the plan, and basically uh, bring it to the commission as we did uh, Tuesday and Wednesday of this week. 
Uh, we did go out there Sunday, the 15th of August to do the field topography. Uh, we basically had a site visit Monday of this week, Monday morning, 845, four of the commissioners were there then. Uh, we finalized the plans Tuesday afternoon, filed them electronically with, with Angela in her office. And I did hand deliver a couple sets of the plans yesterday. And I did meet Charlotte and, and basically gave her a, a fairly detailed briefing of the project. So I'm glad I was there. I'm glad she was there. And uh, at least that information hopefully will, uh, will be positive tonight. But again, the history of the project is there are two buildings that have been in the flood zone since day one. They're at elevation 73 and 7778. The flood zone is AE11 and the butlers and we as the engineers want to uh, obtain approval to basically uh, raise the buildings up, same, same buildings, same dimensions, same location. Uh, the process to do it will be quite different. As I briefed two weeks ago, the, the small boathouse to the northeast side of the lot is basically going to be uh, raised by Gordon Contracting out of Hingham. We're going to raise the building up and bring it back into the, the upland area. We're going to remove the foundation that's there and we're going to install 12 12 inch uh, pressure treated timber piles and basically put the uh, facility uh, on the new piles with an open foundation. So when the storm tides come in, it will be a normal open foundation, just like any other home in an AE zone, an AO zone or a velocity zone. And again, the uh, new elevation will be elevation 11.3. And then uh, from there, we will basically raise up the existing three car garage. The design plans from the structural engineers at Rivermore Engineering and Situate what they're proposing to do is leave the building as is, leave the existing four sides as they currently are. We're gonna cut the building about six to seven feet above grade and raise it up three and a half feet or so, so we can raise the foundation up and still have the same functional use, same height of the building with the new elevation at 11.3 feet. So with, these, with both buildings raised, we will then I'm over at sheet two now for our plan. They basically show the, the need for raising the existing driveway up to meet the elevations of the, of the two buildings. So in other words, if the, if the slab elevations are going to be at 11.3, the apron, the beginning of the driveway will be at around 11.1, 11.0. And then with that, we will need a retaining wall to the left of the garage, a small, uh, similar retaining wall between the two buildings, and then a small uh, third retaining wall, which will be buried into the existing soil uh, to the east of the boathouse. The 11 foot contour here is the high point of the driveway. Uh, the drainage for the new parking lot will be draining towards the west out of the buffer zone. The 100 foot buffer zone is, is right in here, the green line as you see here. So, so the vast majority of the drainage is gonna be uh, drained into the westerly direction. There's a, a catch basin in the grass, the low point of the driveway and the grass in this area here. Uh, so I'm going to say 98% of the drainage will come into this spot here. The other 2 to 3% will, will drain and infiltrate into the existing grass area to the east of the, uh, the uh, boathouse itself. One of the questions from two weeks ago was the drainage for the street, the wall, the stone wall that uh, is basically at the edge of the road, beginning of the Butler property. And from the review of the revised plans, what we talked about in the field on Monday is the, the elevations of Margin Street are between seven and eight feet in elevation. The, the, the crown of the road is a center line crown. So the high point is in the middle of the road. Everything drains, you know, half the road drains to the left. The other half drains to the right. There's a catch basin, back to sheet one, here at the southwest corner of the Butler property that picks up water from both sides of Margin Street. That's at elevation six point, six point three six. So again, a good portion of the road with about a, a foot of pitch drains to the south corner here. There's another high point in here with two sets of catch basins uh, 
adjacent to the frontage of the Butler property. So the water will drain into these two sets of catch basins. And then some of the rest of the drainage will go down northerly towards Atlantic Ave. Uh, but when you look yep. at the contours in depth, we actually have the low point is at elevation six, which is in this area here, just inside the, the property line on the Butler property. Some stormwater will drain that doesn't get into the catch basins into the northerly driveway or the, the exit drive as we talk, talk to the butlers about it. But the vast majority of the water will drain onto Margin Street as long as the height of the tide, the amount of storm surge, and all the other drain pipes are working. But obviously, if we have a, you know, a storm tide with a, a seasonal high tide, uh, yep. kind of all bets are off, but we know the Public Works Department in Cohasset has closed this road uh, as needed in the past. The uh, Pauls, it's, it's, it's a quick question. It's safe to say that the water coming off the driveway from 11 feet down to seven feet and potentially even down to the six is not going to flow up into Margin Street because the front yard acts almost as a small little fishbowl or a giant um, depression area so that, and, and I know, so I just want to get back to the, the drainage off of the driveway um, because is, is that a fair statement to say? It's definitely a fair statement. So when you look at it, uh, you're exactly right, Judd, Justin, the, uh, the the kettle hole is, is in this area here. Okay. So. The, the, the right. overflow, if you will, will stay here, and basically that's the last area to drink. So. Okay. Um, all right. No, thank you. And, and okay. the impervious area of the driveway is actually becoming smaller, correct? Correct. We removed about four to six feet of driveway in this, just north of this side of the retaining wall, about four to six feet is being removed okay. and basically landscaped with softscape material, if you will. So the amount right. of impervious is being reduced, correct. Okay, great. And I know as, uh, as we did, we walk out, we walked uh, the property, we talked about the berm, uh, we talked about the, 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 the seawall there. Uh, talked about the pillars or, or the, the pilings that the boathouse is going to be on, the garage being elevated. The, the only, the, the last question I had is, is there going to be any type of uh, safety screening over the, on the last side of the retaining wall that's coming up there when it goes from on the other side of the boathouse so a car doesn't go over the side there? Correct. So we have looked at an issue, but. Correct. We have looked at some sort of a fencing, I'll just say a, uh, a barricade, but you know, for a residential type use, it will be in keeping with us with what's appropriate. Uh, and obviously, in that area there, I will talk to the building okay. commissioner. You know, before we actually do any work out there, to make sure that it meets with his his requirements from a code viewpoint as well. Okay, great, thank you. Mm -hmm. So I think um, those were the open items from two weeks ago. I'll be more than happy addressing other questions. Thank you. Okay. Uh, you would you would address my concerns uh, with the revisions of the plans. Thank you very much, and thank you for going out there and uh, grade or, or putting the the elevation grades throughout the entire front edge of the property. I know some of the abutters had some concerns about that as well uh, at the meeting that we had a couple weeks ago. Uh, commissioners, any comments or, or, or our agent, uh, any comments on this application? Nope. I just want to say from going out at uh, the site visit, everything was clearly explained just like it was now. And um, I didn't see any issues with it. It seemed like common sense and everything was laid out clearly. Thank you. Yeah. Um, not hearing any com not seeing any comments or questions from the audience as well. All right, last okay. call. Any any. Yeah, sorry, Jay, just one. Um, is there any fill being brought in for the driveway, given that it's changing its elevation? Right. Uh, we are, yeah. We are basically filling, as we discussed in the field the other day, yeah. uh, up to the 11 foot contour at the maximum, and then transitioning, tapering the height of the fill back to the six and a half, seven foot contour. Uh, we actually have, based on the computer calculations, about 534 cubic cubic uh, cubic feet of material being brought in, or cubic yards of material, which is about 20, 22, 10 wheels. Okay, so when you look at the, the, the filling of the driveway, we're going to transition on the house side into the existing grass. 
So the infiltration will go, you know, again, uh, out of the buffer zone, half going into the grass and then into that catch basin, as we said earlier, so. Paul, do you have a specification for the fill? We have one, we didn't put it on the plan. When we contract out, we have, I'll just say, standard specifications for gravel borrow. And then the standard, I'll just say eight to 12 inches of uh, select process gravel. And then we show on the plan on the upper right hand corner, 12 inches of com uh, compacted gravel, and then three and a half inches of bituminous concrete, two inches of binder and inch and a half top. So it's gonna be gravel based? Yes, sir. Yeah. Gravel, well, sand borrowing for the first, uh, mm -hmm. you know, foot or two, and but the last, uh, you know, 12 to 15 and a half inches will be the gravel process material and the uh, bituminous concrete. And, and Paul, can you just uh, one one last time here the, explain the uh, the reasoning for the raising of the boathouse and the garage? I understand it's to make it flood compliant, but if you could just elaborate on that for the commission. Uh, because sure. this is significant, this is work in the civic, you know, a significant amount of work here um, in the buffer zone to an existing structure. So if you could just explain that just very briefly, uh, the rationale for the raising of the boathouse and the garage, please. The rationale is basically just about two or threefold. Number one is being in the flood zone, you know, the owner has, you know, his. I'll say his, his right to petition the town to hopefully improve and protect his real property. Obviously from a financing viewpoint, we're in the flood zone, the flood insurance would be a critical issue here. Uh, but then again, you get the wear and tear of the structure with the seasonal flooding that, that takes place here. And I think in many cases, if it was an inhabitable structure, it would have been raised many years ago. But because one's a garage, one's a boathouse, they're kind of accessory buildings as we define them as. But sooner or later, somebody should take the responsibility to raise it up to comply with today's regulations. We got sea level rise, we got the higher high tide. So I think we know from an environmental viewpoint, and I'll just say coastal engineering, marine engineering viewpoint, that sooner or later, these sort of structures should be raised up to meet the flood zone requirements uh, applicable today. And in many cases, we go a few inches higher just to protect the next few years as well. But again, you're looking at real property preservation, uh, safety for the site, environmental compliance, and really you, you come down to common sense and logic today where there is a need to do these sort of uh, uh, projects, but you still got to comply uh, with the regulations, the coastal and the and the uh, Environmental Protection Act issues. But obviously being in a coastal zone subject to coastal storm flowage, there are no performance standards, but we're performing what we think would be appropriate here, just uh, as if it was not in a flood zone and basically designed under the same criteria. So. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree whether it's done uh, in the next year or the next two years, five years, inevitably this, the, this project would most likely be in front of the commission, uh, and I and and, and uh, so I, I you know I, I'm supportive of the project. I think that uh, if this project were where there were not existing structures already in place right now, I'd probably I'd have some far more significant comments with respect to uh, the the construction, etc. My view on it is it's existing. It's being raised. One of the buildings is being raised, but it's it's truly not even almost being touched. There are pillars being, uh, or piles being driven for the other one. Um, yeah, there's some fill being brought in, but it all all needs to be done. I, I don't see a, a negative impact um, going forward here. The water's already moving in a direction. It's going to continue to move in that direction. All right. Uh, any uh, for any other? Uh, yep. Yeah, I got a question, Jay. Paul, yes. You, uh, you should be aware we've had problems in the past when contractors have brought in fill that's basically been recycled and reused from other construction projects. Could you guarantee that the fill you use is, I don't know what the word is, it's not virgin fill, but that material is clean and has not been used and does not contain any refuse from other construction applications? What we do, Eric, is we prepare our specifications for the, let's just say for the homeowner to get two or three competitive bids we usually put into that the standard requirements for mass highway type projects where it's clean borrow material. 
uh, I would hope that the commission would condition something in that direction because usually with these waterfront projects, I end up as the engineer of responsibility doing the, the waterfront inspections. And if it's necessary, you know, required to do periodic or part-time inspections of the material, uh, that can be done. We've done it before on other projects, building a road, subdivision. So it's fairly straightforward for us at this point in time. But obviously, we'd have a pre-construction conference. We would talk to the contractor a few times before he, we even broke ground. Uh, and if necessary, now with uh, Charlotte on board, the pre-construction conference would probably involve her. And again, just meeting on site with the key players is something that we do for virtually every project, especially sensitive waterfront projects as well. So we, we can do it. I'll guarantee what I can do under my own ability here, but I don't watch the uh, contractor 24 seven, as you well know. But you know, I can assure you that I will do my, my, my best to make it a, a perfect project uh, within reason here. Okay. Paul, you, you used the term, you guaranteed it would be clean something material. What was that second word? Oh, we usually uh, clean pervious material. In other words, Eric, it's, it's gravel borrow where we can use sand, whether it comes from a, a pit, like we have two or three in, in Plymouth down here, uh, but th there are certain areas that we accept gravel borrow for these sort of purposes. Gravel borrow, but with, okay. Right. Okay, but, but with the type of driveway we're building, if they're gonna try to bury us with some unsuitable material, a six or a nine inch stone, we're gonna see it because much of this driveway is only gonna be six inches to 15, 20 inches in height. That small section will be the full, you know, three and a half feet minus the 15 inches of topsoil. So the amount of fill is gonna be no more than zero to 24 inches. Okay. Okay. But Paul, you have to under understand that uh, one of the rarities in this project is that we're allowing you to bring fill in essentially into the buffer zone. We normally don't allow that at all. So uh, we're very um, very concerned that the fill you bring into the, uh, the, the buffer zone okay. is as clean as possible within industry practices, of course. Exactly, correct. And I accept that responsibility and again, condition it whatever reasonable way you want and we'll take it from there. No problem at all. Okay. Right. Okay, uh, any further comments from the commission or our agent? Okay, uh, I will, uh, the, the chair, well, I'm, I'm actually just gonna make the motion. Um, and if somebody wants to move the motion forward, please do so, unless somebody wants to make a motion here. But to move this, uh, move this along, Jay Pampari will, uh, the, the chair will entertain a motion to issue an order of conditions for the project at 49 Margin Street. And they're going to add a specific condition. And the condition being that the soil, uh, uh, the, the soil specifications uh, lo slash location be provide of the uh, of the fill be provide uh, be provided to the conservation commission agent within seven days of being applied to uh, to the subsurface. And what that basically is saying is to address your comment, Eric, there about uh, the agent. Uh, excuse me, the applicant will provide the soil specifications within seven days and to include the location to the conservation agent for approval. That's fine. So that is the motion with a specific condition. Does anybody want to move that forward? I second that. Do we have to condition um, the pre-construction conference or is that just? I think the, the, the pre-construction conference should be typical protocol and in our okay. standard order of conditions. Okay. Uh, but yeah, I mean, we, we can also add it, but I think if we start adding things like that, it's certainly something to talk about moving forward, but I think we, we would probably be here all night with adding conditions yeah. to that. Um, yeah, one, no, I just wasn't sure. Yeah. Okay, so just to, uh, let me just jump back a little bit because I know Angela's taking notes here and I want to get this right. So uh, there was a motion uh, on the table for a to issue an order of conditions for 49 Margin Street with a specific condition that the soil uh, slash uh, specification slash location of the offsite fill be provided, that's being brought in, be provided to the Conservation Commission, uh, be it the, our Conservation Commission agent within seven days of being applied. That motion was moved forward by Mr. Eisenhower. Do I hear a second? Eric, second. 
Kathy got it. Uh, Kathy Berrigan, second to that motion. We'll do this by roll call. After I say your name, uh, please say uh, aye or nay. Uh, Kathy Berrigan. Kathy Berrigan, aye. Trisha Grady. Trisha Grady, aye. Eric Eisenhower. Eric Eisenhower, aye. Jay Pimpari, aye. That vote passes uh, four to zero. We also need a variance. Uh, the chair will entertain a motion for a uh, uh, for the project at 49 Margin Street for to issue a variance for work within the 50 foot buffer zone. Would somebody like to move that forward? Berrigan second. Uh, we need someone just to move that forward unless I missed that. Would somebody want to move that forward? Move that motion. Jason, uh, uh, Jay, how would you like that uh, worded? You just, just say so moved. So moved. Do I hear a second? Just great a second. Either one. Motion by Eric Eisenhower, seconded by Trisha Grady. We'll do this by roll call vote. Please say aye or aye, aye, aye or nay. Kathy Berrigan. Kathy Berrigan, aye. Eric Eisenhower. Eric Eisenhower, aye. Trisha Grady. Trisha Grady, aye. Jay Pimpari, aye. That vote also passes four to zero. Congratulations. Good project. Thank you very much. Good all vote. right. Thank you. Appreciate all your help and support. Thank you very much. And we'll look forward Thank to you. starting you, the project and bringing the town into it. So great. If you could just stop sharing your screen now, Paul, that would be great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Okay. Next up, Megan, if you could uh, move Paul Brogna back to an attendee. And I think for this one, we need, who do I see here? Uh, could you please move up Jason Federico, I believe. And probably Brad Holmes. Hi, Jason. Is there anyone else in the attendees list there you want to move forward besides Brad? I think just Brad. Unless okay. Brad has somebody else that he has coming in for him. Good evening, members of the commission. I believe if uh, Brian Joyce is available, he might be in the crowd. Brian unless he's dialed in, is not going to be attendance. I'm filling in for him tonight. Okay. I'm pinch Thanks. hitting for Brian okay. tonight. Yeah. I okay. Thanks, Jason. <laughs> All right. I, I don't that. see Brian in there. Okay. Uh, let me read into the, let me read the, uh, the public hearing notice here first. Our next item of business is an RDA 21-08. It's the town of Cohasset Public Roads Harbor Maintenance Project. And I'll read into the record the notice of public hearing. Notice of public hearing. Uh, Shot uh, Crete Harbor Project in accordance with Massachusetts General Laws, Chapter 131, Section 40, the Cohasset Wetlands Bylaw and the Cohasset Stormwater Bylaw. The Cohasset Conservation Commission will hold a public hearing on Thursday, August 26th, 2021 at 6.30 p.m. via remote participation on a Zoom platform from the town of Cohasset slash DPW for re a request for determination of applicability 21-08 for a proposed Shot Creek maintenance project to maintain seawalls, revetments, breakwaters, and bridges along the shores of Cohasset Harbor. And uh, Jason, if you want to, if there you have any, I did see the RDA application that come in, either you or Brad, if you want to share your screen to show any pictures. I did see that there were some pictures that were recently submitted. Sometimes those pictures are very helpful. Um, Please let me know, uh, but I'll, I'll let you share your screen if you'd like to. I will uh, just turn it over to Brad um, to present this project, and I'll be here for to answer any questions. Thank Great. you, Jason. Uh, you, if you just uh, state your name and affiliation for the record, please. Sure. Good evening, members of the commission. Brad Holmes with ECR here assisting the town of Cohasset Department of Public Works and Engineering Department on the maintenance proposal for uh, revetments and breakwaters and uh, seawalls along Cohasset Harbor. We've submitted uh, a notice of intent, I'm sorry, a request for determination of applicability application to confirm with the commission that the maintenance work that's performed on these uh, historic structures doesn't require the filing of a notice of intent, but also filed with the commission so that the commission's aware of the work aware of the locations and aware of the protective measures that's implemented during the, 
the maintenance activities. Um, we filed the RDA application to identify 10 general areas within the harbor. Um, we've located those areas on the aerial image here. You can see um, each area that's that's identified on the aerial image. Um, the work occurs within the on the face of these existing revetment structures. Each location varies if, with the amount of resource areas that it is within or abutting, but it's certainly within land subject to coastal storm flowage. It abuts a coastal beach, uh, tidal flat, and salt marsh, and even the uh, a perennial stream being the, the Gulf River. Uh, I, we have identified um, each location in the RDA with photographs. Uh, can the commission see my screen okay? Yeah. Great. Yeah, that's perfect. Thank you. Sure. So each each location we've identified and, uh, and, and put a description in the project narrative along with photographs for the proposed maintenance work that we're proposing. But what we're proposing is um, Trotcrete, which is uh, an application of concrete to fill in the gaps and seams of these um, structures to maintain their stability. Um, it doesn't involve uh, reconstruction or removal or, or, or you know, a, a significant amount of work on the structure as far as a reconfiguration. It's, it's more or less just um, to fill in the gaps and to stabilize the structure and the seams to uh, prevent any um, failures and prevent any need for, uh, well, hopefully in the short term process, pre prevent the, the need for uh, a significant rebuild of these structures. Um, each structure, as I said, has been uh, located and in, 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 uh, included in the RDA application. It ranges from breakwaters to uh, seawalls to um, filling in uh, gaps of uh, existing revetments. We have included in the RDA application, the protocol for performing this maintenance work um, with a step-by-step -step process to uh, first update the commission on our schedule uh, and then perform and set up the maintenance work. All work will be performed by land to the extent possible so that all the staging would be on the landward side and then uh, accessed from the land over the, the wall uh, where necessary, we would place mats, uh, we place tarps, and we would place uh, uh, any silt booms that we would be uh, need to uh, protect the area during the application of the shotcrete process. Shotcrete process is, is uh, basically injecting uh, a concrete slurry into the wall, um, I'm sorry, into the gaps or seams of the revetment to shore up any of the, the, the open gaps and seams to um, you know, improve the stability of the wall. Uh, in some instances, you might have some parging, just some hand application uh, within the seams, but the majority of the work is to apply the shotcrete method with the, with the, uh, the concrete application. Uh, we've also uh, identified the type of work that would be needed to kind of prep the area so that you would chink, place some chinking stone back in where needed and, and just up and get the area prepared for the shotcrete application. And then once that work is performed and completed, we would update the commission with a uh, somewhat of a monitoring report with photographs to bring the commission up to speed on uh, the, the completion of the project. So. I'll, I'll overview it and just go through the photos so that you can see it and then I can take any specific questions that you have. But in general, it's, it's just to confirm with the Conservation Commission that um, we're all in agreement that the work to maintain these uh, revetments and historic structures is maintenance work and that the Commission's aware of it and the locations are, are identified and the, the protocol to do that work is, is agreed upon so that the the town of Cohasset can move forward and perform this maintenance work. Uh, I think it's a great opportunity to get in front of the commission and, and confirm the work and, uh, and, and then nail down the location so you know what's going on at what location. So I'm, I'm glad to 
answer any questions. And, uh, and Jason, if I've missed something that you would like to add for sure, you know, jump right in and, and, and uh, update the commission, but I, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Any, any comments from the town, Jason? No, just that as Brad hit on, the, the, the goal of this is to try and minimize major construction and demolition um, yeah. by, by doing uh, smaller maintenance to preserve it for a longer period of time uh, is the biggest, biggest goal in this. So I, I know this has kind of been, um, unfortunately, an, an already ongoing project here. My question is, is how much work has already been done out in the harbor, first off? Um, how, much work, how much work has already been done out there? Um, if you can go back to the plan view, Brad. Um, area six was done. Um, and I, I believe, I think area six was done. I'm not sure what other portions were, but I, I, I'm, I'm positive that area six was done. Okay, area six only. I can't say only Brian, I, is, that's where Brian would be the one to answer that yeah. for sure. You know, I just know a, I was out there for six, that's why. Yeah, um, I know that we've, we've gone through this and, 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 and uh, we should be reading you the riot act here about why an application wasn't brought forward earlier on. Um, you know, that there, I, I'm questioning first off why this is an RDA application when it's not an, an NOI application. I know we've already done quite a bit of work. How many more feet do you expect to Shot Creek and what's the timing on all of this? Uh, the, the first one is the, the, the bridge, uh, area eight. Um, and the goal of that is, is it's a couple hundred thousand dollar um, shock creep repair versus millions of dollars worth of bridge reconstruction and, and uh, the bridge being down um, for public safety and uh, transportation reasons. So that's the, that's so the first you, when one. You, on the, yeah. So uh, assuming you're going to try and do that in the fall, is this a, like a, a six month project? Is this 2021, 2022? How long do you see this ongoing? The shock creep when they're on site is a week long project. It's not it's not months. Each each site so, is just a small amount of time. So to hit all of these ten areas, how what is the expected time frame to hit Years. these ten areas? Years, I would think. I think this the point of this RDA, and I could be wrong. Brad, you might know the answer to this. I think this is to give a blanket RDA so that this work can be done as needed, as funding is available, um, so that when the funding becomes available, we can notify you guys and then move forward yeah. with the work. So you say the, the, the bridge is, uh, is, the, uh, is this state money, federal money? Where's the money coming from? Uh, town money, I believe, was voted at town meeting for the okay. bridge repair. So, uh, so right now, we, uh, or the town has money allocated to do the bridge only? I believe so, yes. Okay. All right. So when you, when you apply that, so uh, from the picture, it's just, it's going to be shooting it almost directly up completely vertical on the under, how, 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 how are you going to shoot it onto the bridge? It's, it's in the under part of the bridge. So it's just shot. It, it, I don't know if we have pictures of the underside of the bridge, but it's, yeah. it's the, it's the um, vertical face of the bridge is the bigger part. It's not, it, it's the lower part is the, the more critical part. Um, so but even the upper not, part, when you sh it, shot creep, even the upper part, it just sticks on. It's not, it's, it's kind of like gunite pool. Uh, material so it it it, yeah. it just shoots and sticks there's not there's not a um there's there's not a, a huge amount of slough off of that well i guess any amount of slough off if that's the word we're going to use would be would be unacceptable if it wasn't totally captured so uh in that event you mentioned like tarps silt booms is this going to be done from from the water is it going to be done from hanging over the side uh, I imagine it's going to be done at most likely high tide. You're going to have to time the hides, tides here so you don't have significant current running through there. How, how are you actually going to apply that on the That'll bridge? Be, it, it'll be done at low tide for sure. Um, and uh, to be honest with you, I'm not positive how it's going to be applied. 
I, I believe I did go over this with Brian and he was um, describing that it would be done from a barge from underneath so that okay. um, with with a silt boom and, and, you know, tarps over the barge so that there wouldn't be any um, spillage, you know, into the waterway. It would all be captured, you know, on the barge. Um, another point to get to the RDA application, and, and this is something that I spoke with Brian and um, Steve Ivis at the time. You know, if these were something where we were going to be doing something other than this maintenance work and kind of rebuild, then I could see something more along the lines of a notice of intent. But where the notice of intent gets kind of messy um, for something like this is that, you know, you have a butter notifications within, you know, all the different, uh, you know, links. And then you get an order of conditions that's issued to the town of Cohasset that's basically almost impossible to record because these aren't like maps and parcels. These are, you know, roadways or, or, or other, yeah. you know, kind of locations in the harbor. So, you know, because the, the, we weren't altering the structure and it was just, you know, repairing the gaps and the seams and the, you know, where needed, it seemed to us that the, uh, the, the RDA process was the, uh, the better technique to proceed with. Jason, Eric Eisen, I got a question for you. I'm familiar with the gunite process. And I, my, my impression of that is it's a horribly messy, unsavory, filthy process. And it's very, very difficult to maintain the, the powder and the dust in a certain area. Um, I'm concerned that the abutters will find what you're doing quite offensive. Because you mentioned this was like gunite. And I certainly, um, if you were parading up and down the harbor, spraying gunite, I think the, 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 the citizens of the harbor would be quite upset if they weren't warned well in advance uh, to 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 leave their houses and to get get away from the material that's floating in the air. So my question is, if this is like gunite, how do you keep the water from being polluted, and how do you protect the uh, inhabitants in the areas? Maybe gunite is the wrong description. It's basically mixed in um, the hose, so it sucks in the dry concrete. And mixes it with water in the in the hose, and then it's just shot on the wall. Um, Sounds like gunite to me. And I was out there when they were doing it, inspecting, and there was no airborne any issues uh, that I saw um, during the the previous process. Um, and it was actually fairly clean, um, in in my experience being out there, having not seen it before until a few years ago. Yeah, I believe How, also. Uh, this is this isn't a new activity that's proposed. I think I believe um, it's been somewhat ongoing over the years and um, and been maintained successfully without any uh, you know significant uh, impacts like we're uh, thinking about with uh, runoff and and airborne and and gunite as you're saying. Brad, that's what I was waiting to hear. All right. <laughs> Okay, um, so you you can assure us, ensure the commission that this is an activity of very limited uh, dissemination of pollution, dust in the area, and it's not going to be harmful to people living in the area, correct? Correct. Okay. So I'll put it, I was literally standing there and I had no ill effects of any kind of dust or anything. Uh, okay. when they were doing the process. Then it's probably very different than gunite. I, that's what I just use gunite because to me, I've never, I don't have a gunite pool. I just know that you spray on concrete to put a gunite pool up. So I use that as an example. Okay. Jason, uh, I, I, so the, are these the only areas right now of town is basically around the harbor and then you're needing uh, town funding in order to do that? And my, my last question is, or first question is, um, if this RDA is to be approved, it's going to be approved based on this, these specific uh, areas and no other areas in town. But, but has the town considered areas like Rocky Beach for consideration, uh, the stone wall along Rocky Beach area? I would assume that we would probably look at this option for any area uh, similar to these, where you have seawalls that have uh, cracking or, or, and yeah. um, issues like that. It's it, it's a really, it's a nice process that, that um, 
like we said, it, it's it's very for all the options you have, it's the least um, invasive um, mm. and and can uh, hold everything together for an extended period of time in in the least least invasive manner possible. Okay, again, so this so this RDA is just these ten areas that we see on the screen. Correct. That's, okay. Um, so, Tom Bell, do you have a question? Yeah, I have a number of them. <laughs> Um, first of all, I'd point out that area three is in situate. So I would assume that you guys have to um, do some sort of um, presentation to their conservation commission. That's not even, it's not in Cohasset. That's situate. And so I'm not sure why we're, the town of Cohasset is paying for it or even doing it. So, well, they, uh, I, it's a great comment. Uh, if I'll, we'll, 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 can we table that conversation for, for another time? Sure. Uh, but it's a great comment. And, uh, and Jason, take that into consideration. The, the seawall is that, if that's, that portion is in situate, let's, let's discuss that offline. But that's a great comment, Tom. So let's go back to area eight. If you could bring up that photograph again, Brad. Yeah. Uh, so these patches, uh, as I understand it, there's exposed uh, rebar there. Is that correct? Yes. And uh, that rebar is corroded. Is that correct? Yes. What are you going to do to um, remove the corrosion and then recoat it with some anti-corrosive material, paint, presumably that green paint that that uh, seems to be in favor with the uh, um, the state. So you're going to spray, you're going to spray paint in there, right? Brad, do you know what, what the full scope is on that? Uh, we didn't get into that uh, detail. Basically, we talked in the RDA about preparing the area, um, kind of uh, spalling it and chinking it. We, we didn't include um, anything to do with rebar uh, and uh, applications of other anything beyond the shot crate. So no sandblasting, is that right? All, that's correct. The, the RDA application is filed for shotcrete maintenance and preparing the area for the shotcrete. So if there's other activities that would be needed in, in those locations, we'd have to update the commission uh, on that. And if we had to uh, you know, refile for that specific additional activity, we'd have to do that. It, it seems thank, to me that, you. Um, that simply uh, patching over corroded uh, rebar is, is uh, wouldn't be a standard that the state, the transportation would, DOT would would approve. It, you know, if you if you look, if you go around, uh, in fact, I was just passing some repairs that are being done on uh, 93. The traffic was slow, so I got a good look at them, where they had excavated uh, with a appears to be uh, a chisel or a jackhammer ha had uh, exposed their corroded uh, rebar in some of the um, uh, abutments. And uh, they had obviously sandblasted the area and then recoded the rebar to prevent it, prevent further corrosion. Uh, it's my understanding, in fact, I know for a fact that Shot Creek has essentially no structural integrity. The bridge is held up by the combination of the, the rebar and uh, whatever that glue is that you're using, whether it's concrete or shot creed or whatever. So it seems like that there are parts of this project that either we're not hearing about or nobody's thought of. We'd well, have to just come back to the commission yeah. and, and, and propose a different activity or, or update you with a new filing. We, we're not proposing anything beyond what we've submitted in this RDA for maintenance with the shot creed. Right. So let me, I just, let, me just, uh, let me just chime in here again. Tom, you raise a valid question, but what we have in front of us tonight is an RDA for the Shot Creek only. So if there's any additional work that's being done, whether or not this is the, the fix to the bridge is, is not our concern from conservation. It's a DPW issue, et cetera, et cetera. It's a great comment, but what we have in front of us is an RDA for the Shot Creek and the Shot Creek only where, without sandblasting, rebar, painting, et cetera. So, if any of those activities were to occur or were to be expected to occur, the town would need to come back in front of the Conservation Commission with a revised plan, a revised application to do such work. It's a great comment, 
but that's not what we have in front of us tonight. I understand that, Jay, but I would also point out that they've already done quite a lot of wall uh, with their shot creep without coming before us. I just want to be assured that indeed we're not going to find out that uh, some work has been done without informing us first. Yeah. I mean, the reason they're here yep. is essentially because they failed to file uh, a notice of intent or an RDA prior to starting the work. So if there are other things required, I think that they really do need to be reminded, uh, clearly need to be reminded that they're not exempt from our wetlands bylaws. And right. they, so they, need think, they, they need to think again before they, before they just start work and then inform us after they're well underway. So I, I completely agree with you here. And as, I'm, as I've been talking, I've been writing down specific conditions, like with any potential approval, we can, can condition the project with specific conditions. And I've been writing some of those down, advanced notice of approval, uh, further specifications, pre-inspection hearing or um, site visit with our conservation agent, et cetera. So if you feel if we get to the point that additional conditions need to be made, by all means, please chime in and bring those to the attention. Uh, and if you want to make any motions moving forward, just it, they, we could have a hundred conditions. It's totally fine. But you are right. the The reason that we're here is because there was an application that was already done that should have been filed in advance. It was not. And I should sit here and read you the Riot Act, but you've been read the Riot Act behind the scenes, so I'm not going to do it now. We have an application in front of us. Let's move it. Let's move it forward. Let's discuss it. And if we need specific conditions in place so that we don't go backwards, then let's do that and let's get this corrected. So back to the shot for you, Ken. Uh, yeah. Yes, uh, I, I I was down there and watched uh, Mr. Whitehead applying the shot creek, and I would confirm exactly what what uh, Jason said. It's mixed inside their van. Essentially, there's no um, dust to be concerned about. Uh, what does concern me is uh, the composition of the shot tree. I, I asked uh, Mr. Whitehead whether this was uh, saltwater tolerant, uh, saltwater tolerant mixture, and I got an ambiguous answer. So it led me to wonder whether this shot tree, how long it's going to last, what's going to leach into the out of the shot tree uh, after it's cured is that sodium penetrates into, I don't know whether you know, but uh, sodium is a poison to cement. It uh, replaces the calcium in it. And at, as, it, as it penetrates and weakens it, and eventually it will start falling off. So uh, I would wonder about the, um, uh, any issues about leaching of anything out of that shot creek once the tide comes back in and over time. So have you, uh, did, are there specifications for the shot creek mix that you've submitted to us? I don't think we've submitted a shot creek mix design to you guys. Um, we can do that as part of the pre-construction meeting. That's gonna be my note when you were talking in the last meeting, you might wanna have in all of your things, say submittal of materials to be used on the project on any of you, every one of your project to be submitted prior to construction and approved by the agent and or commission uh, as necessary. Um, that that will be a condition for sure. Yes, but I'm saying for every I'm saying for all your like the guy that just was in you could say that in his. But yeah, side note. Um, and back to the note about the rebar. Um, I texted Brian. Uh, they're going to tie in new rebar where needed um, under the bridge. So is that part of this application here and what level of detail is that going to uh, in involve? It would be part of the submittal here. What that would involve would be then drilling in rebar locations, I would assume, and um, adhering them in and then shock reading over the top. So what, what sort of adhesive are they gonna use? I am not sure. Okay, that's a, that's a, that would be uh, another uh, material that we would like to see the composition of and 
and be assured that it's not going to create, there's so little of it, so I, I, it's hard to imagine that it would be a problem, but I think it would be wise for you to um, submit a material data safety sheet or whatever that's associated with that, and uh, so we can at least have a look at it. Sure. What's the timing on this, Jason? I know you want to get the bridge done for us. What is the timing on it? I'm, I'm to, I'll ask Brian. Is it in the next month? Uh, I hate to say this, is, I'm not going to punt, but I, don't, I haven't been involved in this project necessarily. Okay. I am literally pinch hitting tonight because Brian, yeah, no, has, no I, I, Brian I, I, has no cell service where he is up in New Hampshire. Yeah. So therefore you got me. I don't, have, <laughs> I, I don't have self service either. Take a look around. But <laughs> he's in a tent. So yeah. I don't, well, I don't well, think he has I mean, an option. I'm not I'm not far from a tent. Uh, anyway, it just seems like there are a lot of unknowns here. And 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 I know that not next maybe not week. Uh, uh, next week. <laughs> yes. He wants to do it next week. Yes. There's going to be a lot of conditions placed upon this if he wants to do it next week. Okay. Um, Tom, are you writing down your conditions here? I see you thinking quite a bit. I've got three of them already. Well, the, the only ones I would be but, really concerned about would be just to know what the materials were and, yeah. um, you know, see the specs for that. Uh, okay. And, and if they do... I, I'm, I'm a little surprised that they're going to work with that, uh, leave that corroded rebar in place. But, um, and, 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 you know, the engineering of how they're going to tie it all in. But as you would be quick to point out, Jay, I'm sure you would say that's none of our business. So yeah. <laughs> that would well, be something that I would be concerned of were I in a butter here. Uh, I do use the bridge. So, but that's, that's, that's really not conservation business. Yeah. It, it's concerning as a taxpayer of Cohasset, but uh, yeah, yeah, but but uh, conservation, it's a different issue. Similarly, I, right. have my, I have my doubts about how much stability yeah. you get from from yeah. filling these cracks, but that's a that's for another place, time and place, right, Jay? Yeah, unfortunately. So I, I have some uh, my uh, I have some comments about well, not comments of if conditions if this were to move forward about advance notice, specific materials, et cetera, et cetera, pre-inspection meeting that we've already talked about. Um, are there any, any other questions from the commission? Okay, it sounds like, the, yes. I, I don't have any questions. I just think that our, our biggest concern was the notice and to be able to make sure that the, uh, the mitigation efforts are being made at the time so that the agent is able to know what's happening, be there to make sure that the tarps and the slip booms and the tide is all being considered during the project. So we do need to know the time frames. But that will all exactly. be part of your orders of conditions, I'm assuming. Yes. Jay, had they so, not already started the work, I would have asked them what the alternatives are to this project. But I think it's a bit I think it's a bit late for that because they're you know we're at the 59th minute of the 11th hour. But um are there alternative technologies that we could be exploring or is this the only way to proceed, Jason? The only alternative is to tear the bridge down and put a new bridge up. I mean, this is literally, this isn't like uh, uh, we're, we're repairing the bridge. We're doing minor improvements to maintain the bridge. It's like painting your house. We're basically painting the bridge to get another X number of years out of it before it needs to be torn down and replaced it'll be a million dollars, millions of dollar project versus a couple hundred thousand dollars to go in and fill some gaps and make sure the bridge doesn't collapse. That's, that's the goal of this project. It's not, this is painting your house. This is not building a new house. So, so Mr. Chairman, if I may. Yes. Um, thank you. So um, Amy Quessel, Town Council. Um, I just, I do just want to remind um, the applicant that an RDA is only good for three years. There was a comment much earlier that this was a 10 year plus project. So, um, and I know there's been issue, I know there's been concerns from the commissioners about, you know, work being done that wasn't permitted. So I think that, you know, we, we all need to keep track of these three years. So um, there's a good chance they might have to come back. 
that's not a problem. We can coordinate and, and, and you know, update the commission, which we're going to be doing anyway throughout the process. But uh, in three years, we can file a new uh, RDA application if we need to. Thank you very much. Thank you for bringing that to our attention. Hey, and I think the, uh, from the town, an RDA is a little cheaper than an NAY, but it's a drop in the bucket compared to the overall cost of this uh, uh, project overall. Thank you. Any further uh, comments from the commission or our agent? Okay, so this is an RDA. Um, it, it typically would be a negative two uh, <laughs> of, uh, approval. Since we do have specific conditions, I'm going to make it a negative three. And if anybody wants to add to the conditions after I make the motion, please do so. Uh, Jay Pimpari will uh, like to make a motion to issue a negative three determination with conditions for the RDA 21-08, the Town of Cohasset Public Roads Harbor Maintenance Project with the first condition, and you're already up against the time frame on this one, is with uh, at least seven days, uh, at least seven days notice, notice will be given to the Town of Cohasset Conservation Commission agent of any work that will be conducted with specific timing to include the exact timing of the project to address the issue of the high tide, low tide, and you'll know in advance of when the high and low tide is. The second condition be that there be a pre-inspection a pre-site uh, inspe uh, pre-inspection be coordinated and conducted between the town and the conservation commission agent to discuss and go over the exact location of the shot creek in the specific areas that will be performed. The third condition is that the specific a specific application uh, the uh, process to include the materials being sprayed etc be approved in advance for each area by the conservation commission agent those were my three conditions does anybody want to add a condition to that motion okay not uh having heard that that is the motion do i have a second second motion made by the chair uh second by mr eisenhower we will take a roll call vote uh, all those in favor of the negative three determination for the RDA, please say aye and state your name. Kathy Berrigan. Kathy Berrigan, aye. Tricia Grady. Grady, aye. Eric Eisenhower. Eric Eisenhower, aye. Jay Pimpare, aye. Uh, Jason, when, when Brian gets back from his tenting trip, he, he's got some work to do. I just uh, texted you, him. Great. Uh, get in touch with Charlotte as soon as possible to start the uh, pre-inspection and all that good stuff, timing, et cetera, et cetera. Will do. Thank you, guys right, and ladies so much. Thank you. Thank you, members of the commission. Thank, thank you. Good night. Thank you. All right. Uh, Megan, if you could drop... Uh, Jason and Brad back for the time being, and pr please promote. Uh, I believe John Kevin Hours, Kevin Hours, rent uh, representing 98 Howard Gleason, and uh, oh, uh, Brendan Sullivan. If you could promote Brendan Sullivan as well, please. Hi, John. Good evening. Actually, if you could promote, uh, please, Brendan Sullivan for this, I would appreciate yep. my office and I will be promoted for the next two. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Brendan, you're up. Is there anyone else in the attendees list you want to have promoted? Um, I think if Bob Shepard is on there, um, I don't know if he's on or not. He can be promoted to speak. Yes, Bob Shepard. Megan, thank you. I'm going to guess that that's B. Shepard. Yes. Okay. Yes, that would be it. Excellent. Okay. Uh, all right, Brendan. I'm going to let you share your screen and uh, share your screen in a little bit if you want to get that ready. But before we do that, I want to read into the record the notice of public hearing. Our next item of business is a stormwater permit 21-0898 Howard Gleason Road, uh, Shepherd to raise and reconstruct. I read into the record the notice of public hearing. 
for 98 Howard Gleason and if in accordance with Massachusetts General Laws Chapter 131, Section 40, the Cohasset Wetland Bylaw and the Cohasset Stormwater Bylaw, the Cohasset Conservation Commission will hold a public hearing on Thursday, August 26, 2021 at 6.30 p.m. via remote participation on a Zoom platform for Stormwater Permit 21-28 from Robert Shepard to raise an existing dwelling and construct a new single family dwelling with detached garage, paved drive, landscaping and utilities at 98 Howard Gleason Road. Thank you. I see you're already sharing, uh, Brendan. Great. Um, if you wanna give us a little overview, state your name and affiliation for the record, please. That would be great. Thank you. Uh, sure. Uh, Brendan Sullivan with uh, Kevin R. Consulting, uh, representing the uh, the applicant um, and owner, uh, Bob Shepard of Shepard Investments. Um, so this is near the end of Howard Gleason Road, uh, across from the Yacht Club. Um, there's an existing driveway uh, that comes in um, and goes up to an existing uh, dwelling. Uh, so down at the down at the street, there is um, there are some resource area buffers um, and a uh, in a floodplain uh, that we're not doing any work in. We're gonna maintain the existing driveway. Uh, so we're really not doing any work within um, any resource areas or buffers. Um, so the project is to, um, the, as I said, the existing driveway comes up um, and it does. Could you, uh, sorry, Brendan, could you just blow that up a little bit, please, as you move around? Thank sure. you. Appreciate that, thank you. Sure, so the existing driveway does come up um, in, uh, makes, a, makes a, a hard left-hand turn and comes in front of the house. That's basically where uh, the existing driveway is gonna go. And you see the existing dwelling here in a gray hatch. Uh, and the new dwelling is um, the solid, the uh, darker hatch uh, with the driveway in between, um, proposed detached garage. Um, so we are, um, we are attenuating um, and infiltrating the uh, stormwater runoff from the garage in approximately half of the house. Um, into two in, um, infiltration systems um, located um, in the front yard area and the side yard area. Uh, we have a construction entrance um, and, uh, and associated utilities. The utilities are probably gonna maintain where they come in um, and just tie into the existing, tie into the new house as it's constructed. Uh, we do have a, uh, a, a impervious patio in the back of the house. Um, and was also submitted was a landscape plan. Um, and I think really that's about it. And so this is a stormwater permit. There's uh, no buffer zones, no wetlands, resource areas we have to worry about on this property. I did see something down at the beginning of the driveway or is there, uh, but that's yeah, yeah. about it. Yes, as I mentioned, these buffers come off of an offsite uh, BVW uh, in floodplain, but we're not doing any work down there at all. Um, that's all so, existing. Yep, yeah, it's all existing. We do have we do have a siltation uh, silt sock um, encompassing all the the work uh, around the perimeter and the downstream slopes. Okay. And I noticed there were like seven test pits uh, being done. So uh, thank you very much for the, the test pits in advance. The uh, Caltech chambers uh, did it. Did you do a test pit underneath them as well? And can you just ex uh, talk about the test pits, the soil depth to groundwater, etc.? Yeah. So surprisingly, we found we. When the, where there was depth, uh, we did find um, some good material, uh, a loamy sand. Um, and the, waddle, the models were down, when we found models, they were down 50 or 60 inches or so. We were out there just after a rain event. So a couple of the areas that we did find, we found some Orangeburg pipe with some water in it flowing out of it. I think that was from old, some old roof leader systems that had been there. Um, that was in like, um, where test pit number four and five are, uh, which are, four was done right under where this infiltration system is, uh, just down slope of the house. Um, and number five was adjacent to the driveway up in this area here. Um, so, um, so we did So we did encounter some water, but it's not groundwater. It was there from the previous rain event that was, that happened the day before. As you know, it's been a, it's been a wet summer. It's been, it's been, yeah. <laughs> it's been hard to get, the wettest find, ever. Some, find some dry, dry time to do some yeah. test pits. Yeah, that's an understatement. So the existing, there's an existing, how, what, what is the uh, increase in impervious area out there? Is there an increase in? Yes, there is a, a there's bit. a net increase in impervious area of uh, about 6,700 uh, square feet. Uh, the existing dwelling is about 1,900 square feet. The proposed dwelling is about 4,700 square feet. 
And what, how are the uh, pre and, and post construction numbers uh, on this for the rain events? So they're, they're decreasing in volume and rate um, in, all, in all of the events, you know, the 210 and 100 year event through the, through the use of the uh, infiltration and the attenuation that the underground infiltration systems will provide. And is all of the proposed dwelling and the garage being captured in the infiltration tra uh, chambers in the front of the house? Uh, no, just the um, all of the all of the garages, all of the detached garage in approximately okay. half of the house. I have a note here that uh, this system is going to capture about 2,700 square feet of the roof area, which is just a little more than half. The roof area, the roof area including the porches, is about 4,700 square feet. Uh, we're capturing about 2,700 of that. What's the uh, square footage of the size of this home? Uh, the gross floor area. I do yeah. not. I do not have that. I don't know if Bob has that off the top of his head. What? Uh, yes, what the, I home, the home is going to be five thousand square feet. Okay. So, uh, thank you. Is so? Uh, does is this permit? Uh, is this project then going to large home review process? Uh, no, we, I, we don't. We don't reach the uh, six thousand square foot threshold. 6,000, why, why did you say 6,000 square foot versus the 3,500 square foot threshold? It's, it's, it's a 6,200 square foot lot. It's the lot, yeah, the, the lot is 60, 62,000 square feet. So it's the larger okay. of, I think the larger of 3,500 or 10% of the lot up to 6,000. Okay, are there any other permits that are needed on this, uh, on this project um, besides, besides stormwater? I don't believe so. Okay. Uh, commissioners or our agent, any, any questions on this project? I have a question about the, um, the walkway. It, it's a little difficult to see, but you said there's a, there's a walkway that goes down to the water. Is that correct? 20 foot, is that 20 foot wide walkway or long walkway? And what is that? Yes, right up here. Yeah. This one here? Yes. And does that cut through the the buffer zones? How far down does that go? Does it go through the hundred and the fifty? So yes, it does. That's the existing driveway. Uh there's there there is an existing this is an existing twenty foot right of way that actually starts at Howard Gleason Road and goes all the way over to Whitehead Road. Um it's an existing way that was created back in the nineteen early nineteen hundreds. Um but this 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 driveway is already paved. Um, we're going to leave it and maintain it as a paved driveway. We're not doing any work um, down by the entrance here. But is that different than the walkway? I read something that was a walkway, that 20 foot walkway. Is that to the side? Is that going down? Uh, it said walkway on the plan. So I, that is, that's different from the driveway, correct? Or, or are you, is it the same thing? Um, no, I'm not quite sure where you're talking about the walkway. I don't um, think... let's see. Let's see. Like I said, the, yeah. the existing 20 foot right of way that, that goes through the property and carries on beyond. Um, hmm. one of your plans, it said walkway. That's why I was asking. And I thought, hmm. Um, okay. Well, if it's not a walkway, it, it refers to the driveway then you're saying. Yes. Okay. Brandon, there is a dirt road or pathway that leads around to the right, which we've all been down because we've covered this under the Phragmites project. Yeah. I think that's what you're talking about, isn't it? It curves around down in oh, down this, there's a culvert and there's a lot of Japanese knotweed and, and all that. One that it happens. It comes up to the top of the hill. Yeah. So that's, that's, that's off. Pro this, uh, so Mr. Shepard only purchased this property. Um, Mr. Herman still has um, ownership over this property as well over here, and there's no work proposed over there. Yeah, except I, if we're talking about the walkway, it's probably that walkway we're talking about. Yeah. It comes across and then curves down uh, under the other property. Yeah, I think it comes around in here somewhere. Right, right. But there's no work proposed over there. Gotcha. Tell me, um, Brandon, I'm, I'm looking at the landscape plan. Basically, you're, you're planting bushes and trees around the house. What happens to all the other intense foliage that's on the property now? Because it's, it's a, a well-covered 
plot of land currently. Yeah, so I so I do have a I do have a tree line defined on the on the plan here. So all the all the trees and 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 landscape will be maintained, you know, obviously outside of that tree line, which the landscape plan and the landscape um, tree line in the front yard is is about in this area here. If you can see where my cursor is. Brendan, can you expand that a bit? I my, my eyes are not as good as yours. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Where is this famous tree line? So there's a tree line that's shown right here, just oh. almost along these. Uh, silt fence area so that's the tree line so all these will be all these all these trees we maintain in the front yard and then and then in the back is um we have a tree line that follows the back of the property it goes about halfway up the hill um okay. and curves around here so all these trees we maintain as well so that, that's a um a line of of no disturbance in terms of uh, being further from the house yes correct yeah. yes okay Further comments from the commission? One quick one. Um, you indicated even though you're increasing the impervious area, you're decreasing the overall volume and rate um, based on the infiltration system. What's the improvement percentage of the project or? The improvement percentages of the storms? Yeah. Um, I don't have the percentages. I could read you the rates off if you want to hear them. I, I read them. I was just trying to get a, a more of a sense of how much <laughs> like collaboratively, how much better it is than if the existing. And my uh, guess runoff. is in the my guess is maybe in the in the five to ten percent range. Yeah, so it's not a huge improvement, but you can, I get it. Right, we're yeah. making we're making it better than what it is today. Right, right. Uh, Brendan, all we, we can ask. Yeah, <laughs> I get it. <laughs> Brendan, who did the planting plan? The landscape. Um, that was. I'm sorry, Bob, who was that? That was Xena Designs out of Hingham. Okay, all right. Okay, I mean, it's, uh, it, you know, we normally don't get involved unless you're planning in the buffer zone. And this is well beyond the buffer zone, but you know, you, clearly you're, you're planting for a, a moist environment here. And I, I hope that's gonna be the case. And this planting plan will be uh, part of the record and part of the approved plan if the yep. if the project were to be approved as well. So uh, will be considered if if a certificate of completion or compliance needs to be uh, performed later on. Further yep. comments? Any comments? Okay. Not hearing any uh, any comments. The chair will uh, make a motion to issue a stormwater permit for. Uh, Still want to permit at 21-28 at the location of 98 Howard Gleason Road, Mr. Shepard, the raise and reconstruct. Um, I make a motion to approve the stormwater permit. Do I hear a second? Second. Motion by the chair, uh, second by Mr. Eisenhower. All those in favor, we'll do this by roll call. Please say aye. Kathy Berrigan. Kathy Berrigan, aye. Eric Eisenhower. Eric Eisenhower, aye. Trisha Grady. Grady, aye. Jay Pimpare, I that vote passes four to zero. Great. Thank you, thank, Brendan. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Good luck. Thanks. Megan, if you could now promote uh, John Cavanaro. Hi, John. Is there anyone else you want to promote? Uh, no, not at this time. Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay. Great. All right, I'll share your screen here in a second, John. Let me just read the, uh, so we, th this is kind of like a, a, which you'll explain a little bit more in a moment here. We have on the agenda a notice of intent 21-24, 74, and 86 Beach Street, the revetment restoration. Let's tackle that first, and then uh, because that's the way it is on the agenda, and then we'll tackle the NOI for the 74 uh, Beach Street uh, for the dock right after that. Is that okay? That sounds perfect. Thank you. Okay. Whenever you're ready for All me right. to start. Uh, let me read. Okay. Let me read into the record the uh, notice of public hearing first. Uh, notice of public hearing for 74 and 86 Beach Street in accordance with Massachusetts General Laws, Chapter 131, Section 40, the Cohasset Wetlands Bylaw and the Cohasset Stormwater Bylaw, the Cohasset Conservation Commission will hold a public hearing. On Thursday, August 26, 2021, at 6.30 p.m. via remote participation on a Zoom platform from applicant Deborah Power, 
for a notice of intent 21-24 for rock revetment as part of an ecological restoration limited project at 74 and 86 Beach Street. If you want to share your screen, John, that would be great. And uh, okay. give us a little uh, overview of the project. You're, you're frozen okay. right now, at least on my screen. Yes. Um, so for the record, uh, good evening. My name is John Cavanaro. I'm a civil engineer from Cavanaro Consulting in Norwell, Massachusetts. And as you mentioned, I'm here uh, on behalf of the Barbara Power Realty Trust. With Debbie Power is the uh, trustee and the owner of 74 Beach Street. And also, uh, because this is a joint application with 86 Beach Street, Dick Stevens um, is also the owner at 86 Beach. So this is sort of a co-application. Um, the reason this, this project sort of came about was, uh, even though we're presenting the revetment project first and then the dock second, it started with Debbie uh, approaching us with the request to provide access to the harbor via um, an elevated uh, walkway, pier, and ramp, and float. So when we went down to look at the site with her, uh, and I'll just pull up a picture of the site, we walked along the coast uh, from her property across, looked at some areas where it made sense to site um, a dock. We talked about various options of docks, whether it was a, a full pier, ramp and float, with the chapter 91 license, or as other folks have been doing on Little Harbor and other areas where there was an opportunity to build a smaller system with just a platform ramp and float, that was also a, a more modest option. So, but in looking at siting things, we realized that actually the, the edge of the, the coast was actually have, suffering from severe erosion. Um, some of which she didn't even realize after living on the property for, for many years. So um, after taking an initial walk, we realized that this, this erosion actually runs all the way down from her property uh, across to the Stevens property. And it made sense to reach out to, the, to both families to see if there was a joint interest in first uh, addressing the slope and then secondly, going back to with the dock application. So this is uh, somewhat of a joint application, but this, this first piece really is to uh, halt and, and hopefully revegetate and allow some of these trees that have really gone into, into peril and some of which have, have perished, um, sort of halt that erosion process that's happening along this edge. Uh, it looks like it's it's probably happening from a couple different reasons, and, and both from the coastal storm flowage, uh, storm events from the coast side, and, and potentially from runoff from the land side uh, coming off the ledge. But it, it clearly has reached a point where uh, it's starting to accelerate uh, amongst itself, and what Debbie remembers as uh, sort of a scant uh, collection of, of debris is is now getting deeper and deeper into the into the upland so the goal here is to go along uh, the coast we identified really a, a pinpoint uh, where there's an existing set of stone steps and running along that eroded edge uh, to uh, two large outcrops of ledge and then really ending terminating on the Stevens property where there's a, a prominent outcrop of ledge adjacent to his uh, existing dock. And in addition to that, what we would like to do is include a set of stairs as part of the revetment project, because there is a right of way that passes through the Stevens property and provides access to uh, an adjacent neighbor that will, that comes down has access to the beach. So rather than continuing sort of this um, uncontrolled pathways, uh, what we're proposing is to address that, that edge with a similar treatment that we did, but on a much smaller scale along Jerusalem Road, if you recall, at the Starvish property, that there was severe erosion along the Atlantic Ocean. It was a much bigger bank, much, right. much steeper and, and much more uh, 
big in scope. This is actually a 10 scale drawing. So this is not as, as big. It's about 120 feet long and it's, it's probably about a three foot elevation drop from top to bottom. Uh, as you noted in this, in this photograph, it's not a, a very big drop, but what we'd like to do is essentially get ahead of trees like this that have not yet uh, gotten to a point of trees like this. So what we'd like to do is to work along the edge, backfill some of these areas that still have room for, for saving, and then put down a geotextile fabric and essentially backfill that with larger stone, a stone revetment and run that along that 120 foot length with yeah. the set of stairs in the middle. Can you go back to that, uh, the rip wrap uh, uh, little diagram there, John, please. Sure. Yeah, thank you. And just describe that a little bit with the geotech uh, fabric and then the rip wrap wall. Right. So, kind of different layers. so we have a couple of different scenarios out here and this is sort of just a, a typical detail. Um, but what we have is we've got, situations where there are trees like that first tree that I, I showed you that is up here and the edge goes out and it's and it has sort of an eroding side yeah, yeah. and so in this case what we what we want to do is get a smooth edge along to allow that filter fabric to go down to uh, prevent the fines from coming through the slope and continuing to erode so that that sort of pro, pro, um, provides a barrier between the sedimentation and the rock fill. So that allows water to continue to flow down, but it's we don't want fines to come through. Uh, we want essentially the, the water to go down and to make its way down from the from the land side. The other situation that we have out here is where we have trees that are closer to the bank and we have, um, actually what we have is root systems that are sort of coming out. So in this case, what we'd like to do is to come in and put in some material. Hmm. To Try to save up. the tree. Yeah, save the tree. Actually, yeah. this is, this is a, a poor illustration. We have these what we would do here is, is sort of fit. Yeah. It's, and, and you have your eroding thing yeah, happening yeah, there. It's quite clear in your photograph, John. You can see the, the roots yeah. bulging out below ground. Yeah. Tell me, John, uh, out of curiosity, have you done an inventory of the tree types? Have uh, I been what? An inventory of the tree types you're trying to save? Because you may find out that a lot of them are invasive species and maybe not worth the effort. Well, absolutely. We're going to go through that in and, and inventory. Uh, some of them may not be. Uh, worth saving, but the goal is to, you know, some of the the cedars and some of the the hardwood natives juniper, yeah. we'd like to keep. Yeah, uh, they, they're not all going to be able to survive. Um, so that, what we're trying to keep, we're basically working from the back of the coastal beach up uh, as quick as we can get up, and then keep this keep this work area to a minimum. I think so on, 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 in that picture, you showed us some smaller look like some, uh, I don't know, they look like pines in the picture there. They cedars. Were kind of, yeah, yeah they, oh, those are cedars. Okay. Yeah. Um, how, so it, how are those, are those going to be protected or is the wall going to kind of be behind them or in yeah, front so of them? Or? In this case, there'll be, that, that, that wall will be sort of behind them. This is the yeah. area where the steps would go up. So this yep. is on the edge of, of the stairs. Um, so it, it's going to be sort of a meandering to try to hold that, that edge to its as much of a natural contour as possible. I think what you'll probably find, John, is a lot of Norway maples in there. There definitely will be some Norway maples. Yeah. Do you anticipate, John, that uh, any number of trees need to be removed or are you just assuming that you're going to try and keep them all, but with a potential that some of them may have to be removed? Some of them are already far gone, quite frankly. Uh, they've tipped over. They're on the slope. Uh, there's some cedars that are absolutely dead, and they've just been sort of strung up. Um, so we're going to 
we're going to work to save what we can, but like Eric said, there's going to be some invasives. Yeah. There. There's going to be a lot of, a mix of, uh, of lost soldiers, quite frankly. So what we're trying yeah. to do is stop it and protect everything else that's, that's upslope. Do you, have you marked on the plan which trees you know are these dead sh- soldiers already? We have not marked them now because, believe it or not, some of them are clearly looked at, others looked at, but we've had instances in the past on these coastal projects where something that looks like it's far gone, especially if it's a non-invasive tree, and we've backfilled it with some material and armored the opposite yeah. side of stone and, and it'll come back because yeah. some of these species are so hardy in this environment that you do everything you can to try to save them. Sure, that, that's right. But John, it all starts with a good inventory, doesn't it? Pardon me? It all starts with a good inventory of the tree types you have there. You need to find out what trees you have, invasive or not. Mm-hmm. Uh. Comments from the commissioners? I don't know if you were uh, done with the presentation, John. Sorry if I interrupted That's fine. you there. Um, comments from the commission? Jay, I think my only concern is, is that we, you know, if we're going to go ahead with this project, we know exactly what we're talking about in terms of the trees, what's going to be, re- you know, what they want to remove, what has to be removed, um, making sure that when we finish with it, we have the best trees that are still there and they're in the right positions. And that's really just another, that's field work uh, with an arborist um, yep. and putting that plan together for the next stage. John, do you have a time frame on this project if it were to be approved? On yeah, we'd, you- we'd, like to get a, we'd like to get going in this uh, construction season this fall. So, I mean, we'd be happy to put together, work with Charlotte and, and put an inventory yep. together as a condition. Um, it, it really is a matter of, yeah, we're going to try to save what we can, but some yeah. just aren't going to work. How I mean, long do you, the project. yeah. How long do you think this project is going to take from start we're, to we're finish? Told, we're told, we're um, told on the quickest side, two weeks on the longest side, three weeks, depending on weather. You will be okay. putting the riprap in place manually, John. I'm sorry, Eric. I... We'll be putting the riprap in place manually because we would not probably want to see any sort of dozers or earth moving equipment. Well, they'll, they'll be, they will be equipment to carry some of these stones. These yeah. are not uh, stones that you can carry by hand. So these are, these are several yeah. hundred pound stones. So is it uh, safe to say more. that all of the, all, all the machinery will be uh, up, upgrade of the, of the bank? Safe yes, to say. but some, some will have to will have to get in some temporary access and get down uh, and work on that uphill side. Uh, not working on the salt marsh, of course, but it's it's pretty firm ground. It's shallow to bedrock material down there. It's a hard packed. Even the, uh, the beach area is it's a stone rocky beach, so we'll be in and out as quick as possible. But there are a lot of trees on the upslope, so. A goal again is to try to save as much of this right. landscape as possible. Can you put the uh, the plan up again, John, and just talk about the the, the buffers there, please? So backing out a little bit, we have uh, salt marsh is actually a band of salt marsh. There's a there's a front edge and a back edge. And then between the salt marsh and this eroded bank is would be classified as coastal beach. And then the top of the bank uh, the, runs to the first break and slope above the floodplain. So the floodplain is contour 11. And in this case, it, it runs right at the contour 11, but in the steep areas, it actually jumps up. So that the top of the bank actually yeah. runs around the top of the ledge. So. And okay. so the area you're talking about is that uh, like the is it the two or three contour? No, we're we're it's actually we don't. Get oh, I'm sorry. Five. I'm sorry. Yeah. 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 We don't. Yeah, get I'm lo- I'm lo- yeah, I'm looking down on the other side of the yeah. um, down by closer to the marsh. So, All right. So we're about a foot and a half above mean high water. Okay. All right. At the lowest. 
So you're not worried about any 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 tidal influence here. Water's not coming up that high. No, we're not we're not going to be yeah. working. I don't think the tides are going to be a dramatic um, influence yeah. on the work. And the amount okay. of work that it takes, the contractor thinks that he can do this in a pretty quick manner. All right. It's not clear to me whether this is a coastal bank or an inland bank. Well, it's, it's a coastal resource. Um, this is tidal waters, so this is considered okay. a coastal. It, it's land subject to coastal storm flowage. Um, do you have an estimate of how much fill you might need, or is it going to depend on which ones, which trees you deem salvageable that might need to be backfilled? How many trees? Was that the question? No, no. Do you have an idea about how much fill you'll, you might potentially need? Um, no. In some and, cases... and it, yeah, that really depends on what yeah. is getting saved. Um, right. We'll yeah, keep right. anything that gets scraped on site and yeah. bring in whatever is necessary to save what we can. And all the materials are going to be stockpiled. In a, we've identified an area uh, far up when actually outside even the buffer zones from the top of that bank on the power's land that is okay. um, accessible through that right of way. And okay. Mr. Stevens has been very cooperative as um, a landowner to allow us to pass through some very well landscaped property that we'll have to get all redone as well outside the buffer. John, I, I haven't heard mention okay. of any planting plan, nor have I seen any. Can I assume that the owner is committed to keeping this area of the parcel as naturally forested as possible? Yes, okay. there's no plans for any ornamental. Okay, good, well done. I, I think we we uh, we talked about kind of some conditions about the trees. I'm trying to come up with a condition about the trees and I understand it sounds like we, we won't, it would be nice to say tree one, two, seven, and eight are going to stay and nine, 10, 11 are going to go, but it sounds like it's going to be a, a design as you go type of a thing with the trees. So, uh, so I'm going to make a, a condition um, in, in a moment here um, and, and run that by the commission. Um, any further comments? Okay. Well, let me, let me talk about this condition first. Um, uh, John. And so my, my condition, I, I assume, and, and, and as I explained, it's, it's unknown whether or not you, I guess you really won't know whether or not there are, uh, whether or not a tree is going to be removed until you actually get out there and start doing the work. So for the sake of the argument about doing that, I'm going to assume that all of the trees are staying. However, I know that there are going to be, as we said, some dead soldiers out there. So I'm going to make a condition that if any trees are to be removed or the construction project, that they be approved to be removed by our conservation agent um, at the time of construction. And, uh, and I would leave it up to the agent if she wants to bring uh, uh, one of the commissioners on to oversee that by all means. But that would be my condition. Um, are you OK with that? Yes. Hey, I just had a quick question in terms sure. of evaluating whether or not the trees are, you know, worth sal salvaging or if they're dead. Um, in terms of bringing somebody else on, is there usually like any sort of go-to to, you know, that's kind of like a tree specialist or do you, do you normally um, outsource for that or is that just a commission member like you said? No, that, that's a great question. We certainly could condition that to, to have an arborist come in. That's why I was questioning on the timing. If this was like a one-day thing where we were talking about one or two trees, um, John, is there a way to condition this that we could get, uh, as, as Charlotte brought up a great point, a, uh, uh, an independent review on that in, in one day within like a couple of hours to say tree ABC would come down versus doing this over having someone come back, you know, every other day or every third day? Uh, how, how could we do that? Yeah, I mean, I would recommend that you have an arborist come out. We can recommend an arborist or you can select an arborist um we'd just like to if it's something that we're going to pay for we'd want to be part of the selection sure. process or the uh, approval to, to some degree and well, have, I, have, I have a lot of experience with trees 
uh, I will accompany you down there and I think we ought to have an arborist, okay? And I think it can be done fairly quickly, all right? But important for the arborist is to set the criteria as to native versus invasive um, and, and what the owner would like the place to look like afterwards, John. Because the ar the ar you have to control an arborist and set criteria for his decision taking, so. Okay, yeah, so, what I was uh, trying to get is, I, I just didn't want, it would be great if if the arborist could come out one time and one time only, not to come out and then come out right. again and again and again. So Mr. Chairman, um, if I may, yes. uh, would the arborist be, um, would that be a peer review? Would that be coming out of a 53G and a half count account? So the applicant would be paying for the arborist, but the arborist would be working for the commission. Correct. Or is that an arborist yeah. that the applicant will be paying, will just be bringing out with him? Yes, correct. So we would get a retainer for, okay. I don't know, a thousand dollars or something. Uh, we, we would, uh, you know, you know what an arborist charges for a day's worth of work. Uh, John, we would, uh, we would get a retainer for an arborist, but yes, the arborist okay. would be working for the town. Okay. So that would be funded by the 53 G and a half account. So, um, so we would then, um, that, that the choice of the arborist would be on the commission. That would be your choice. Um, obviously the yes. applicant could, you know, offer his opinion, et cetera, but it would be your choice only because they would be working for the commission. Yes, correct. I wouldn't foresee any conflict here. I think a knowledgeable, competent arborist um, would come through with uh, common sense uh, recommendations that we would all agree with. Yeah, I agree. Okay, there. before I forget, there is a question in the chat box. Uh, I'll read it into the record. My name is Burton Balkind, and I'm wondering, how is 74 Beach going to access the resource area to do the proposed work? Uh, John, do you want to try and answer that? Again, sure. the question is... Uh, yeah, as, as I mentioned, um, the, the access is through Dick Stevens's property, who is also the co-applicant. So he's at 86 Beach Street. Um, and this, the, all the sourcing and the staging will happen on 74 Beach Street. And there'll be temporary access that will be, as we talked about, from top and bottom, really, to work around the trees and the slope. Okay, thank you. Any further comments? Yeah, I'm still kind of struggling with the idea that you're essentially building a seawall in Little Harbor here. And I'm looking at the bylaws and it's not entirely clear to me that you're not doing something that would fall under section 18B, bank heights, bank stability. Could you address that, John? So the question is, are we impacting bank stability? Yeah. Yeah, that, that's the whole point of the project. Yeah. Uh, the, the, <laughs> I realize that. You're, you're trying to prevent erosion. This, yeah. This, uh, so so uh, I, can, I can talk a little bit about coastal yeah. banks and, and sort of this. Sure. There's two, parts of, two types of coastal banks. Sometimes they do both functions. But one is a, basically a vertical barrier that uh, provides storm damage prevention, okay? It's a vertical buffer, and that's, that's what we have. Another type of coastal bank is a bank that provides sediment to barrier beaches, dunes, um, and other types of coastal beaches below. So th that's more of a bluff bank. So there are limitations as to doing work in a bank that has the sedimentation factor to it, where it's providing sediment to a dune or coastal beach below. This is not one of those types of coastal banks. This is a vertical barrier to provide flood protection and prevent storm damage uh, control, essentially. So when you have those loose banks, basically, like on Cape Cod and the islands, you can only do coastal structures when you're protecting the structure that you're protecting at the top of the bank has been around since 1978. Um, and you're limited as to what you can do on those structures because it's, it's a more sensitive bank. It's a, it's, 
the intent of those banks is to sometimes erode so that because they're providing sediment to those beaches below and that in, in a dune and that essentially in turn provides flood protection. This vertical barrier that we have is eroding. So we're losing the, the actual performance of this vertical buffer to prevent flood, uh, store, flood damage or storm uh, damage prevention. So what we're trying to do is save what's left of this eroding vertical barrier by protecting the trees that are there um, and reinforcing it, not with a mortared seawall, a reinforced concrete wall, but a, a, a loose stone short, it's about three feet. Um, and we think it's, it's certainly appropriate for this application. Would this be considered fill? Um, well, yeah, it's, it's, we're bringing in material. Yeah. It, it just, I, I mean, I, I, reading the bylaw, it's not clear what the, uh, uh, how this might fit in, I guess, to me anyway. It, this seems like a natural process to me. And as sea level rises, of course, this bank is going to erode further and further back. It's going to happen all over our coast. And I just wonder what the uh, restrictions are surrounding uh, any attempt to uh, protect this particular place in, in Little Harbor. I, I also see that it's that it's uh, considered a salt for our regulations is considered a salt pond, but there's little said about uh, what restrictions might apply other than algae removal and such to our salt pond. So I, thanks for clarifying what you're doing and that it is conforming with our bylaws. Welcome. Any additional comments? There is a, another, I guess it's a, in the chat box um, from Mr. Uh, Balkine as well, mentions uh, regarding the right of way. So you won't use the 25 foot right of way question mark, and then a comment that is accessed through 76 Beach Street. And I don't want to get into uh, property right agreements here. I'm just more concerned about the NOI project that we have in front of us. Yeah, I, um, we're certainly not going to access land that we don't have the right to access. We'll say that. Right. Understandable. Okay. Any uh, further comments? All right. I do have some specific conditions here. I'm going to make a motion. If anyone wants to add to the conditions here, please do so. If I... Uh, if I inadvertently uh, don't capture them all. Jay Pimpari will make a motion to approve the NOI 21-24 for 74 and 86 Beach Street with the following uh, conditions. Although it might be a standard condition, that seven day notice be provided to the, at least seven day notice be provided by the applicant in advance to the Conservation Commission agent before any work be conducted. Secondly, that the, uh, the town at the applicant's expense will retain an arborist to oversee the potential removal of any trees uh, on the project. The applicant will provide a retainer in advance after notification from the town on what that retainer uh, may be. And the intent is that the, um, that the applicant, excuse me, the uh, arborist would only be out there for uh, like a half a day to oversee that and, and make the uh, decision. Any trees that are, to, the third condition, any trees that are to be uh, removed will need the approval of the Conservation Commission agent based on the arborist uh, recommendations, et cetera. And of course, on the day that the arborist is out there, the applicant obviously uh, is more than welcome to, to be part of those uh, discussions, but the ultimate approval will be will rest upon the Conservation Commission agent with respect to formal approval of any uh, trees to be removed from the site. Those were my three conditions. Does anybody want to add to that? Okay, not having, um, I don't know what your screen looks like. Mine's frozen with everybody. So I'm looking at a bunch of faces staring at me. Nevertheless, there is a motion on the table. Does anybody want to second that? I'll second that. Motion uh, by the chair, seconded by Mr. Eisenhower. We'll do this by roll call vote. Uh, Kathy Berrigan. Kathy Berrigan, aye. Uh, Eric Eisenhower. Abstain. 
Uh, abstain. Trisha Grady. Trisha? I'm sorry, I wasn't loud enough. Aye. <laughs> Jay Pimpare, aye. That vote passes uh, three approved uh, with one abstention, but that vote does pass uh, three out of four votes. So that, that project is allowed to go forward. Thank you very much. Okay, our next project is very similar to this one. It is an NOI 21-25 for 75, uh, excuse me, yes, 74 Beach Street. Uh, power, the residential dock. I will read into the record the uh, notice of public hearing. Notice of public hearing 74 Beach Street in accordance with Massachusetts General Laws, Chapter 131, Section 40, the Cohasset Wetlands Bylaw and the Cohasset Stormwater Bylaw the Cohasset Conservation Commission will hold a public hearing on Thursday, August 26, 2021 at 6.30 p.m. via remote participation on a Zoom platform from applicant Deborah Power for notice of intent 2125 to install a private residential dock at 74 uh, Beach Street. John, is there anyone else you want us to promote for this? Not at this time, Jay. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, just again for the All record. Right. John Cavanero from Cavanero Consulting. I'm a civil engineer. We're uh, offices at 687 Main Street in Norwell. Uh, I am here again uh, to represent Debbie Power from the Barbara Power Realty Trust, uh, who lives at 74 Beach Street. So I'm going to share my screen again and pull up the site plan. Um, <clears throat> we are back in the same location, and now we're working solely on the property of 74 Beach Street. Um, so 74 Beach Street has access right now to Little Harbor through a set of stone steps. Um, they have a store their kayaks sort of along the coast here. There's a small kayak rack. And the goal here is to provide access uh, atop the beach area. So um, th there's not a need to drag vessels across this band of salt marsh that exists between uh, the upland area and Little Harbor. So rather than building a, a large structure across the salt marsh and into Little Harbor, uh, what's being proposed is to create uh, a small landing uh, onto a 12 by 12 platform that sits above the salt marsh, landward of the salt marsh, and sits above the mean high water line and has a ramp and a float that comes out seasonally affixed to it. So this is not a structure that would trigger a chapter 91 license because we're not proposing any work below mean high water. Uh, this does trigger a zoning board of appeals special permit for a use of a residential dock and work within a floodplain. So we have filed a special permit with the Cohasset Zoning Board of Appeals. We're scheduled to be heard on September 7th. We submitted this application uh, to DEP and Division of Marine Fisheries. We received a DEP number from, uh, file number from, from Mass DEP, and we did just receive comments today from the Division of Marine Fisheries. And they essentially had three specific comments on the application. One was pertaining to the float which we are proposing because the float itself will bottom uh, onto the mud flats. We'll propose to have this elevated on skids to have at least 30 inches of separation between the bottom uh, of the float and uh, the tidal flat. And their first comment was rather than put this on skids, which is typical for other docks in Little Harbor, they suggested that uh, we consider putting driving piles in Little Harbor and then putting float stops so that the float sits above the ground at all time. We don't think this is a feasible um, recommendation by Division of Marine Fisheries. There are no other pile supported float systems that I'm aware of in Little Harbor. Um, yeah, it would seem I, like a, a visual obstruction and, and that doesn't seem feasible to us. 
Yeah, I, don't, I, don't, I don't support that comment at all, John. I agree with you. I, I wouldn't support that uh, DMF comment. I, I wouldn't want to be putting piles out there. Let it come up and down. Right. The second uh, comment that they had was they questioned whether or not the, the platform itself, uh, even though it's located above uh, high water and above the salt marsh, um, that it has the potential for uh, impact to the salt marsh. So they had a comment about the size of the float. And their last comment was regarding uh, for a barge that was um, used for this construction, that it be regulated to uh, not bottoming out, but there's no barge being proposed for this work whatsoever. All this work will be performed from the land side uh, and it will be limited to the construction of the platform. Uh, the only thing that will happen on the water is when the ramp and the float are floated in to the property and connect to the platform. So there's no work on the water side whatsoever. And so how are you driving those piles, John? So the, the back piles, the um, dock contractor did some test bits out here to determine yeah. depth to bedrock. And uh, the first three piles will three to four or four of the five front five piles will likely be pinned to ledge um, and the backside piles will be driven as adequate depth to set up a, a land-based tripod and they'll drive those in. So for the first five there, there's, there's minimal uh, impact other than drilling into the ledge. Correct. Okay. There'll be, there'll be fasteners that will be affixed yep. to the ledge and it'll be connected. Okay. How uh, high are those above the uh, existing uh, bedrock there, John, or our ledge? Well, the ledge is, is literally inches below ground in some areas. There, there's yeah, large. So how high will the actual dock be above the? Oh, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, it'll be uh, average about six feet on the okay. on the low side. So, and it the ground slopes up. So, yeah. John, uh, there was a project about a year and a half ago on the other side of uh, Little Harbor, where we objected to the building of this type of a platform uh, because it's in the resource area and all that. I don't need to go into that. And you came back with a rather ingenious solution of, of eliminating the platform and using some bolts whereby the, the pier was attached. Um, I can't remember the name of what house it was. It was about a year and a half ago and it was your solution, John that carried the day. And I think this would be a great case to do the same thing because I'm personally not in favor of having a major construction project like this, the platform per se, um, in the resource area. So could you talk about why, uh, I'm sure you can remember because this is a big problem. Yeah, you had. yeah. so. Uh, why, why that would not work here? Why we can't, why you haven't considered that? Yeah, so that, that particular one was on solid ledge, if you recall, it's on the island, the peninsula island uh, off of Gammons Road. And that had a platform that had the ability to put something on an elevated landform that was um, really what we were creating really was a level mounting pad for the ramp. So that was a situation where we had elevation uh, that we could put something on without bringing in any type of foundation or pouring co concrete. Um, this is a case where we're, we don't have that vertical separation. Uh, if, if this was a, a piece of ledge that we could work something off, cantilever off or something and, and have the ramp come off of it, we just don't have that benefit here. So this, this particular location requires some type of platform to affix the ramp to. So you're, you're saying using your engineering creativity that if we decided that that platform was not to be allowed because it's not con uh, consistent with the wetland regulations, you would not go ahead with this project or you'd find an alternative solution, John? Well, I, I don't know that this is really inconsistent with, uh, this is actually a small version of a, a, a dock system. So we, we don't have a, a typical pier that's running across the salt marsh into Little Harbor with a ramp and a float off of that. So we're not creating a, a large permanent structure that's spanning across the salt marsh. We're trying to minimize this, the structure, keeping it above the high water mark 
outside of the salt marsh, um, keeping it close to the to the land side. Um, but it is a permanent structure. It is a permanent structure. I, I suppose yeah. that's my op my opposition to it. I don't I don't think in that area of Little Harbor, in the resource area or buffer zone, whatever, we should have permanent construction projects like this. And we've, we've, we've discussed this before. Um, the rest of the project, the pier and the float will be removed seasonally, whereas this, this stays. And I, I don't think it's consistent with the wetland regulation. Um, John, John, can you talk about the, uh, the actual <clears throat> surface that would be potentially disturbed as a result of this? I understand the, the float, the gangway, et cetera. They're, they're, so there's, there's no disturbance at all from what I see to the salt bars. This is not a project where there's gonna be um, major driving of piles, et cetera. But there is a, um, the, I guess, yeah, you just go back and talk about the, the disturbance, which we talked about the pinning of potentially uh, five uh, piles or piers, six by sixes, whatever they are, mm -hmm. and then the three in the back. Sure. So. Uh, what we have is a rocky coastal beach, essentially, between Little Harbor, salt, a band of salt marsh, and then we have a rocky coastal beach that is on land that's shallow to bedrock. So th this is all ledge. You've seen um, on the ground in the beach, there's large ledge outcroppings that run along this, this beach. They, they go as far out into the salt marsh in some areas. This is all ledge outcroppings out here. So... This is all shallow to bedrock ground. Um, in this area that we're proposing the platform, it, it will be pinned to ledge that is literally inches less than a foot in some areas below grade. Uh, and the remaining piles, we're, we're talking about literally um, 10 square feet maybe, if that, with all the all the piers that will go in the ground, less than that, much less than that. If they were one foot piles and we're showing eight, that would be eight square feet. So we're even less than that. Um, that's what's touching the ground uh, on in the resource area. Above that is really just a set of stairs that goes up to this elevated platform to allow for the ramp to be fixed to that and to provide uh, six feet above the ground. So th that's really it. And this is something that is a very little impact in terms of construction timing. Uh, this is a, probably a few day construction project, a week most. I have a question. If you, if you went with the recommendation by um, the Division of Marine Fisheries and, and lessened that platform to four feet, how would that change the impact? How many pilings would you need at that point? I would imagine a lot less. We'd still need probably six. So we might you lose would... a couple of them. We'd have one, two, you know, depending on whatever the-, the Not width. four? No, I don't think no. four. We'd, we'd still we'd... need that 12 feet yeah. span. So we'd want at least two on, on either end. Okay. Um, and um... Maybe even one in the middle. And would you object to, to following that recommendation? I'm, I'm curious as to, you didn't really discuss yeah, that. So yeah. the, the design was meant for, to be as accessible as possible, quite frankly, right. um, with a wheelchair and even to put kayaks on the sure. uh, surface so you could walk up and store rather than have anything on the beach, which is what happens now and things yeah. get dragged across the salt marsh. The idea is to, stay upland at all times, stay up, up and then cross the salt marsh and not walk across the salt marsh at all with any vessels. So that's, that's why it's been designed and cited at, at the size that it's at. I guess the reason why I'm asking, and I, I, I appreciate like access for sure as being an important component, but you know, we have recommendations by um, the Division of Marine Fisheries and what out of three, I don't think you're considering any of them at this point. Well, well the barge doesn't count because you're not going to use one. So, yeah, well, two of yeah. them, I think, <laughs> so were very two, feasible. Yeah. Two, uh, yeah. The third one, it's, it's really up to the commission. If, right. Right. You know, if you guys think that it's 
egregious um, that we're asking for this size of a it's you know, 12 by 12. It, it, the 12 can't really change because we want to get from upland. Um, it, it's it's more of lessening the impact because this mm -hmm. is obviously. Right. What's the In smallest size of a platform you, you could put out there, John? Well, I, ideally we'd like to probably have you know, we could knock it down by 25%, say, or in that order of magnitude. We'd like to still be able to get a vessel uh, on on above ground and so that it's not right. stored on the... So if we, if we made it so that we could just uh, eliminate a couple of piles in the, in the center span and keep it, um, you know, say eight, eight to nine feet wide, and reduce it by 25, 30%. I, John, I, I just don't understand why we're, you know, you're saying that by reducing the size, we're going to force the people to drag their boats across the salt mine. I don't see that happening at all, all right? Um, you know, that they won't be dragging them across the salt marsh because they won't be going out until it's high tide, all right? So, uh, I think we're, we're creating a problem here that doesn't exist. Yeah, I, I think the whole thing could be reduced down to the four feet, which is recommended. And, and I think that's probably what we ought to do is, is a, a conservation commission is follow those wise thoughts. John, can you talk a little bit more about the, that third uh, condition by the Division of Marine, Fish, Marine Fisheries? Uh, the first two, I think we can throw out. What uh, can you talk a little? Because I unfortunately I, I did not see, I haven't seen that comment letter. Um, I did probably yeah, went so, to some. So uh, their their, uh, their third comment was as as Trish mentioned, to consider making the platform four feet wide instead of twelve feet wide. But I think and we also, health, they also spoke about the, the health, float. Based on the health of the salt marsh. Well, right. what, what they say is the potential yeah. the potential expansion of the salt marsh. Yeah, but it's an environmental benefit. Yeah, I, I, I think also, John, I think they also had um, recommendations that we didn't like about the float, you know, adding pilings there, but is there other alternatives there? I think they were worried about the actual float, float resting. Um, I think there yes. could be other solutions potentially for that too, beyond what well, they recommended. <laughs> that we well, it, will, it will be elevated. Um, yeah. So it, usually the, they'll come back with either elevate it if if there are no skids being proposed, or they they just make sort of blanket recommendations. They're not as familiar with the locality um, as yeah. we are, so that's why these aren't conditions these are recommendations for the conservation commissions to consider so they don't i i don't think probably appreciate that there aren't any pile supported floats yeah no, I, I do I, I do understand that i just didn't know if there was any because they had their rationale so i didn't know if you could speak about that and if you yeah i, I think it's honestly pretty minimal impact um okay between the skids coming up and down but john the purpose of this platform is for boat storage well, it's for access to the water and we sized it so that it could have a kayak and also be accessible. Um, so you've got a 12 by 20 float out there that of course could, you could put several boats on and a mere five or six feet away, you've got, I don't know whether that's lawn or what it is on the um, landward side of your uh, seawall. Uh, looks like there's probably plenty of room to store boats there. So I don't see the necessity actually uh, in terms of boat storage for that 12 by 12 platform. So would it be the commission's suggestion that we reduce this is there um i think it would be good if it was consistent with the rest of the, the dock itself at four feet i 
I would I would be comfortable with I would increase it from four to six feet just as far as uh, having accessibility, et cetera. Uh, you know, four feet is, is not very wide if you are trying to get a wheelchair or something else out there to at least maneuver, move around for accessibility. So I think four feet might be a little stringent um, for something like that. So I, I, I would be in favor of increasing it more than four feet. My with question the, is, sorry, Jake, go. Well, my question is, would the length still be 12 feet? People talk about the width, but I mean, the, the length is still going to be the length. If you cut right. that uh, roughly in half, it's still going to be 12 feet long. Right. And, and again, the minimum, the impact to the ground remains close. It, we, we can reduce it by reducing the width, but the length yeah. won't change the on the ground. This is really the on the ground impact is is minimal to start with, but it yeah. will be reduced. But it, it Joe, if you went if you went with an eight by twelve, could you get away with two pilings in the front and two in the back? I think I think they probably could. Eight feet would be uh, a desirable width if we can agree to yeah. eight feet. I think from and from an engineering standpoint, if people are worried about the, you know, forget about what it what it looks like there. If you're looking about what our concerns are from a conservation perspective here, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight uh, pilings, if you want to call them pilings, that are supporting this platform. If you went to uh, an eight feet across, still keeping the 12 foot length, you would probably be able to eliminate uh, at least two of the pilings. Correct, John? Yes. You could probably get two in the front. You'd probably still need two in the middle to carry the 12 feet and you'd need two in the back. So you'd have six pilings as opposed to eight pilings. And that would limit the amount of pinning and that would limit the amount of uh, pile in the back. I mean, if, if you, whether or not the, it was four feet, six feet or eight feet, you're still going to have six pilings there. Still going to need two in the front, two in the right. middle, and two in the back. Right. So uh, the environmental impact to the pinning, et cetera, is not going to change whether it's four, six, or eight feet. So I would support going at, at eight feet. I don't, I, we haven't seen the, um, the letter from DMF, but uh, was, there was there concern the number of piles or was it shading of the uh, of the beach there? It, it's shade, it's really shading of its potential future March habitat. It's the shading. Yeah. Yeah. So, but what is the what? We're what not is the above the thing? salt marsh. We're six feet above that. Um, you know, they want they want one and a half to one. So what they're saying is that for every, and that's when you're on top of the salt marsh with with a peer this is not that case so we're you we're know John, our our rules and regulations say we are not permitted to alter a salt marsh in any way whatsoever exactly All right so yes uh, and that's that's what this design coming does back, coming back to the letter all right which alludes to the fact that anything more than four feet will alter the salt marsh. I, I mean, we can argue forever about this and we can make compromises, whether it's four or six or eight, we're just, we're trading horses here, all right? Um, you know, at some point, I think we have to get down to the reality that anything more than four feet probably is not positive for the salt marsh, which we're here to protect. Now, That's Jay, not real. Jay, Jay said six feet because of, of wheelchair. Okay, maybe we can make that compromise. All right. In case there's a wheelchair, is there anyone in the family who is, is wheelchair bound now? Is that a big concern? It, is there? It is a concern of the family. Okay. So they would right. like that. That was the that was the initial drive, quite frankly. Okay. Twelve foot width. But well, 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 you've got a three foot ramp, a three foot wide ramp. Pardon me. Well, it seems like the the you have a limit. Uh, you have a you have a ramp there that's only three feet wide. So if that can accommodate a wheelchair, then why can't a four foot platform? Is to get somebody out here to enjoy the water. I, okay. The that's, we're not, so not, not to get out to the float necessarily. Not necessarily. Yeah, okay. And so you've got some 
steps there also, uh, would you then put in a ramp so you can bring somebody up in a wheelchair? Or it's just only a couple of steps, so it's probably not a big deal. If we could agree to eight feet, that would be with the same, essentially a reduction of on the ground footprint. Say that again? If eight feet would be a, a reasonable compromise, I, I don't see it impacting. We're, we're not, we're staying outside of the salt marsh. We're elevated by six feet above the beach. I'm personally okay with eight feet. I've seen projects here where there's, as you all know, significant impact to the salt marsh where we have 436 piles being driven into the salt marsh out 400 plus feet into uh, Little Harbor and uh, the Gulf River, et cetera. So I, I personally see that this is trying to minimize as much as possible the disturbance to the salt marsh. So I would not have a problem with an eight foot by 12 foot platform there. And the addition of removing the stairs and putting in a small ramp there that would be more accessible to, um, to having a potential wheelchair if in fact uh, a wheelchair is gonna be used to get out there. Yeah. If, if accessibility is this what we're talking about, then let's make it accessible for not only someone in a wheelchair, but somebody that could potentially be elderly, et cetera, uh, would trying to climb these stairs and just moving it out, what, at five, six feet with a little bit of a ramp, it's not gonna be an issue. Right. You know, we're, we're, we're adding a lot, to, a, lot, a lot of criteria to the wetland legislation, which doesn't exist in the legislation. We're kind of making up as we go along now. So if, that's, if you want to trade horses, we'll go ahead and trade horses. Tell me what you want, Jay. I, you know, but <laughs> that's not what I want. I'm just, I'm only, I'm only one vote here. Remember what I'm trying to say. But I think it's the opposite, quite frankly, of what you're saying, Eric. Yeah. It's not, that's not the case. I mean, these, this is a, an allowed use. It's an allowed structure. Um, people we have, live on Little Harbor. It's not as though every single one of these. A, we have a recommendation of four feet in writing from the state. Now we can, we can say that's bullshit. All right. Well, forget about it. Then I'll go home and I'll go down and have dinner right now. Okay. I don't think you need my vote. So good night. Bye. Now, right. I, won't, I won't sign off. But you know, you can't sign off. Don't please do not sign off. We will not have a quorum here. I understand your concerns. I understand your call it wait, time in it, please. Just one second. I understand everybody's concerns. I remember that the vision of marine fisheries. Uh, you typically have been involved with them for years. They make standard boilerplate comments to a lot of the projects, like the project about there cannot be a barge out there. Well, there's not going to be a barge. And their comment about putting the actual float on pilings. I, I personally don't think we want the float on pilings. Does anybody support the first comment by the Division of Marine Fisheries about disturbing the, uh, the, the, the Little Harbor by driving piles into Little Harbor by putting, uh, by putting piles out there. So I don't support those first two comments. The last comment, you know, I, I support it to the fact of, I don't, you know, I think four feet might be a little overly stringent, but if other commissioners want to go at four feet, again, somebody please make the motion. I'm okay with going more than four feet. That's just my personal comment. Now, again, you know, we've seen much further disturbance. We've seen, as you know, piers, we could, we'll probably have a pier next week where there's 800 piles being proposed to be driven right through the middle of the salt marsh. So again, I don't want to deliberate this all night either. I, I'm okay with, uh, with, with four, six, or, or even eight feet. When you talk about the structure of the pile, you have to look at the structure of the platform. There's still going to be two piles in the front, two piles in the middle, and two piles at the end whether or not it's four, six, or eight feet. And if it's the shading, then we talk about the spacing. But if somebody wants to, to make a, a motion, I'm, you know, I, I'm, all, I'm all for it. I'm, I'm just one vote here. Well, John, John has, has correctly pointed out that this doesn't even go over the salt marsh. Yeah, so I, I'm, I'm okay, I'm ready. I, I'll make a motion if somebody, unless there are further comments here. 
or, or, or John, if you want to, you know, revise this plan a little bit as well, because my motion would be not to accept the current plan as is, but would require a revised plan. And I don't know what your timing is on this as far as if we can, um, we can get a revised plan next week. We'd accept the condition okay. with a reduction in the width. Um, we would prefer it to be eight feet to maximize accessibility. So I let me also this John, on the risk, John, if you come back with eight feet, you run the risk of it not being passed. Well, let me just, so, right. so let's just move ahead. What, what, are, what are commissioners comfortable with here? Because I don't want to just move this forward, ask mm -hmm. for the, the applicant to continue it and, and come back here. So without, you know, deliberating, what, you know, what are people's comfort levels here? So, because we, go oh. ahead. I was going to say, I would, <clears throat> since this was built in mind or proposed to be built in mind um, for accessibility for somebody in a wheelchair, I think that should be, oh, well, I'm going to consider that one of the important things in, in the width. And so, um, you know, I would agree with an, an eight foot wide float so that person can move around and has comfortable accessibility. So, okay. Uh, the only thing I would add is, you know, the letter came out and was just posted today. So I just want to have a better understanding of the rationale for the recommendations. Um, and I think if there are creative ways to answer to the, the intent of those recommendations, not only just the pilings, but the shading and the potential environmental impact, I think I'd be, I'm open to any kind of compromise. I just, that's why I originally asked like how many pilings, if you put it down to four feet, how much is that gonna change there? But mm -hmm. there was two impacts. It, was, it wasn't just the pilings, it was the shading. Um, same thing though, also for the float in terms of it resting on the, on the, um, the bank. So, uh, you know, those are just, those are my concerns. I'm very open to compromise, especially when it's about accessibility. Um, and I know we have, it's, it's hard to balance what we've done in the past and what's been done over the years with, you know, moving forward. So I, I, I think we can come up with a compromise. I'm not exactly sure what that is though, John, that's just my. Well, I, I, think, I think what we're trying to talk about is reducing the overall right. impact of that platform. It's exactly. gonna be six feet. Of, first of all, these recommendations are for structures, permanent structures over a salt marsh. Yep. That, that's what it's, and we don't have that. So we've designed this so that we're not designing permanent structure over the salt marsh. So that's the first thing. Okay. His recommendation is guiding towards the potential expansion of the salt marsh, which okay. anything can happen, I suppose. So we're addressing that in the sense that we're gonna reduce the width of this proposed platform by 30%, 33%, four feet out of 12 feet we're eliminating. Okay. We're still trying to achieve our original goal we're going to reduce the amount of pilings that will be on the ground. So that will provide a, a net impact benefit. So I, I think we are reaching a compromise. I think the suggestion to put piles out in Little Harbor is a non-starter. And so right. we're addressing that by putting in skids beneath the float so that there is separation to allow for the benthic activity to happen, which is what they're after. They want... Um, habitat to be able to pass through while the float is on the yeah that was on the original plan right the skids yeah but john you know you you're a bit you know what's going on here with the salt marsh as as globally water levels rise the salt marsh will creep in towards the shore as there's more water underneath the structure it's made very clear in the memo we received that we're talking about enabling the salt marsh to grow and prosper in the future, all right? Um, and the less light there is, the less that's gonna take place. I, and that's part of what we're supposed to be doing is protecting these environments. And as, as far as the accessibility, if we really wanna do it, we should make the pier six feet, not three feet. Because if you, you know, it doesn't make any sense just to get up on the platform, all right? You probably wanna get out to the, you know, to the, the raft that's floating out there. And they'll never get out to that if it's only three feet wide. So accessibility is, is a very limited value here, I think, because it's only gonna get you onto part of the platform, not out to the whole structure.
Well, we've been at this for a little while now. Yeah. Just for the record, there are some comments, um, a couple of comments and a question in the Q&A, but it is from uh, the person has not uh, announced themselves in full name and or, or, or address. So until that happens, I'm not going to uh, address the comments in the chat box. Secondly, again, what we're asking for or what it seems to be asking for is the applicant based on the commission's comments to come back with a potentially revised plan. But can we come to some informal agreement on what this plan is? If the applicant comes back next week with an eight by 12 or an eight by eight plan, are we gonna go through this, deliberate on this all over again? Is there some consensus that you wanna live with or do you wanna deliberate this again? Because what I, what I sense is gonna happen here is we're gonna continue this hearing Come back in two weeks, leave it up. If you want to leave it up to the applicant to propose whatever they want to propose to address the commission's concerns. And then we'll talk about this again in two weeks. Or we, or Jay, we vote on it now. Oh, you've all frozen. Didn't like what I said. I'm okay with that. If we can agree to a, a modification to the plan that there's a consensus and we will revise the plan in accordance with that condition. I suppose in the in in the in the the act of goodwill and in compromise, I could I could vote for something that was six feet wide. I would not want to go any more than that. All right. Given what's been said by the Commonwealth of Massachusetts in the memo and our obligation to protect the salt marsh. Is that something other people could live with? From twelve down to six feet. But that I, I'm okay with that. Tricia? Any yeah, further comment? Get to me between four and six. Oh, Jay's back and forth on my end. I'm sorry um, if I'm interrupting anyone. I think um, it's it's a neg negligible, so I think I can I could certainly live with that. Um, and I definitely want to compromise for sure. I um, if that's it's in the spirit of compromise. Yes. And, and Kathy was concerned about the accessibility and the yeah. accessibility would be enhanced by the six feet. All right. So you know, yeah. that's the way I see it. John, what is the time frame on getting this, uh, the doc done? So again, we'd, we'd prefer to, to move this along because this is, this is the first step of many. Yeah. Um, so yeah. the sooner that we can close, the better. First step of many, what John? Zoning Board of Appeals, um, which is oh, I see. A, a lengthy you, process you, you, in itself. Yeah. It's a couple months, so we'd, we'd I, like I to. You were okay. implying you, you had a lot of docs waiting our way. Oh no, no. <laughs> no. I wish I could control that, but unfortunately, <laughs> yeah. you have to. And and just to be clear, John, the 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 uh, uh, float and the um, uh, connection to it, um, the you know the uh, the walkway. That's a, they'll be removed seasonally. Is that? Yes. Is that, yes. Yeah. Okay. And stored on site? Is that, is that the stored idea? Stored in an upland area. It, it may actually be taken off site, or, but it'll be floated off site and then trailered and then either brought to yeah. uh, the, the, man, the managers or the, the person that services the float. He actually houses them at his facility in Marshfield, or he'll relocate them to an upland area on the same okay. property. John, given that you have to go to ZBA and some other stuff, it doesn't appear that two weeks, um, continuing this for two weeks with a revised plan uh, is gonna be impacting your, your time frame here. It sounds like there's some informal consensus that commissioners would feel comfortable with a six by 12 platform. And if you wanted to revise the uh, steps for yep. more of a ramp system, I would personally be more comfortable with continuing this hearing for two weeks and putting it on the agenda earlier on. Uh, and hopefully it would not be a very lengthy conversation and approve a more formal plan rather than trying to condition it and giving that you still have a little bit of time to go with some of the That's other uh, boards in town. That's fine. I appreciate, uh, well, I appreciate the, del the deliberation and the consistency and the consideration. Okay. So are you okay to continue this for two weeks to revise the plan based on the commission's comments? 
Yes. Okay. All right. Any further comment? Okay. We will uh, continue this to to when is our next meeting? I believe it is September seventh. I believe September seventh. The, the ninth. The ninth. The ninth of September. Okay. So we will continue the NOI 21-25 with the applicant's consent uh, for 74 Beach Street till September 9th. And, uh, and we'll, we'll work on that. Thank you, John. Thank you very much. Thanks, John. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank Thanks you. for the consideration. Thank you. Okay, next on the agenda is a discussion for a stormwater permit 16-36, three Diab land plan updates. I don't know if anyone from the audience is here. Uh, James Garfield. Uh, can we, uh, oh, there we go. Can we promote, I don't know if James is gonna talk. Uh, hello, James. Hi, hey, do you we have any files on this? I'm gonna to get to that in a minute. I just wanna, James, are you here to represent the, this, the, this, the, this discussion, which is going to be very brief, by the way? Yes, that's correct. Okay, so just to give uh, Charlotte, if I miss anything here or anybody wants to chime in, there were some plan updates that were submitted from what I understand. Uh, typically, I'll be right, I'll be honest with you, we don't typically discuss this type of stuff in a, in a, town, in, in a form of this nature. This, I think, can be easily, should be discussed between the uh, current owner of the property and the uh, conservation agent uh, outside of this. I understand there are, um, there are some proposed uh, uh, plans that are in place. Um, I know you've stuck around for an hour and a half here or two hours, James. So I'm gonna give you uh, a, very, uh, a very tight leash here if you could just describe exactly what you're proposing here in about 30 seconds or less so that we can move on. Thank you. Sure, sure. Uh, do you mind if I screen share? Uh, if you can do this all in 30 seconds, be my guest. And okay. I'm not trying to brush you off, but this is not, we don't have any plans in front of us. We don't have an application. This is not something that we typically discuss in a meeting like this. Right, and that's understandable. But uh, I guess for the record, James Garfield, I'm an engineer at Morse Engineering. Um, so there was a stormwater permit for a new single family house that was previously permitted by the commission uh, in 2017. And we've since revised the plan for the new homeowner um, who's actually planning to build. We've reduced the, well, and basically we're, we uh, revised the plan to address a new building footprint that they ended up going with. And along with that, a new driveway. Um, so we've reduced the roof area by 16%. Um, Reduce the gravel driveway by 35%. The tree line. Okay, uh, James. James, I'm I'm going to stop you right there. Yeah. This is this is this. We do not have an application in front of us. We do not have anything to go on. I understand the, what you're trying to do here, but I would encourage you to talk to our conservation agent, and if our agent uh, and feel free to she can reach out to the chair or the vice chair. I think that this sounds like it might need an amended stormwater permit or amended application. And so I would encourage you to talk to the chair tomorrow, excuse me, talk to the agent tomorrow or Monday morning to discuss this. And if it needs a revised application, please submit one and we'll formally talk about this uh, in a public forum. Okay, sounds good. Okay, yep. I don't wanna be uh, uh, blunt here, but that's that's the way we do it. We, we can't talk about hypothetical situations when we have nothing in front of us. Fair enough. Okay, thank you, good luck. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, next item of business is minutes for approval. And for 325 and 617, I didn't have any comments to those. Did anybody have any comments to those? No, I read them. I didn't have any comments. Looked fine. <laughs> okay. I have the same comment. You asked me to approve something that's five months old. I can't remember <laughs> what we discussed in detail. So I'm going to abstain from the one back in March, but I, I can do the other one. All right. You know, no problem. So let's, let's do, let's do these separately. Say, these are legal uh, documents. 
Okay. So I don't feel comfortable to sort of say, oh yeah, I was, that was kind of the discussion and all that. If I don't remember clearly what we were discussing, I, I don't think I really, I have the right to sign off. But I, uh, I understand and I agree with your, uh, your comments, Eric. We are working to uh, correct that problem and I will talk about that in a little bit. And uh, we are going to have minutes out in a more timely manner moving forward. Well done. So Jay Pimpari will make a motion to we'll do these separately to approve the minutes of March 25th, 2021. Uh, all those in favor, please say aye. Kathy Berrigan. Kathy Berrigan, aye. Eric Eisenhower. Abstain. Tricia Grady. Grady, aye. Jay Pimpari, aye. Those minutes are approved as 301. Jay Pimpari, make a motion to approve the minutes of June 17th, 2021. Kathy Berrigan. Kathy Berrigan, aye. Eric Eisenhower. Eric Eisenhower, aye. Trisha Grady. Um, I wasn't in attendance, so I abstain. Okay. Uh, Jay Pimpari, aye. That vote passes 301. Thank you. Conservation Commission business project updates. Uh, there, These are kind of... <laughs> Ones that have been out for a little while now, I will very briefly go through these. Uh, Charlotte, if there, if I miss anything, please uh, let me know. And again, I don't mean to uh, be brief, but we've talked about a lot of these. Uh, 74, excuse me, 44 Border Street. That is the old Salt House. We have continued to request from the building department the uh, independent monitoring reports, as I understand that have been two independent uh, monitoring reports be done. I've yet to see those. Um, hopefully we see those soon from, I believe Merrill Engineering was out there and you know the status of 44 Border Street, the old salt house and what's going on there. The project is um, working towards completion. The, the harbor wall, we discussed that tonight. We had the RDA in front of us. So there's not much left to discuss about that. 76 Lambert's Lane is yet another continuing ongoing uh, project. We had a brief discussion with town council earlier in the week. Um, we will continue to, uh, to work with the uh, applicant uh, on 76 Lambert's Lane in hopes of maybe getting a revised plan or even a potential revised um, stormwater permit and or revised, or I should say amended NOI order of conditions or an amended uh, NOI on that application. Lot C, Dolan Lane, as I understand, a cease and desist order has been placed on the property by the building department. Since the building department is seems to be taking the lead on that, um, I feel that conservation uh, should basically just take a step back on that and let the building department uh, continue to work with the homeowner. If there's a cease and desist by the building department, there's really nothing left for the Conservation Commission to do at this point because there's no work being done so we would just let the building department work with the, uh, with the owner of the property. Uh, topics not reasonably be anticipated within 48 hours. Um, I did mention a little while ago uh, some things we we're trying to, Chris, our chair, McFarlane and, and I drafted a document, a roles and responsibilities document that is uh, hopefully going to be finalized pretty soon that kind of tightens up a lot of these informal things that we've been working on for the past uh, few years, such as uh, just that as an example, like getting the draft order of conditions out to the commission within a certain time frame, getting the minutes out within a certain time frame, things uh, uploaded to the OneDrive, uh, setting out time sequences for the conservation agent to do pre-inspections and meet with the engineers, et cetera. I hope that that document is finalized uh, within the next week and signed off by, uh, we had asked the, for the town manager, um, uh, John Halen, the uh, uh, building uh, department inspector or director uh, to be signed off, to sign off on that well, as well as Chris and I. So hopefully that document is signed off on soon and it will be circulated out to everybody. That's really all I had. I know uh, I'm filling in here as you see. And, uh, and Chris is on vacation and I'm on vacation too, but trying to do my best here. <laughs> Are there any other topics not reasonably anticipated within 48 hours or Charlotte, anything I missed you want to add? Nothing to add for now. Thank you, Jay. 
So I want to add All right. uh, a follow-up on the uh, uh, trustees and Turkey Hill area. Uh, okay. St Steve and I uh, met with, um, with Wayne uh, Coelho out there. He was the uh, manager for the trustees of that property. The uh, owner of record is actually Cohasset Conservation Trust. We uh, established that a probable bordering vegetated wetland uh, extends from um, one end clear, clear to the Cohasset border and probably well into Hingham. Uh, we gave uh, them some advice. I think that we should send them a letter, uh, probably send a letter to the uh, owner of record that okay. um, they need to, uh, let me back up just a little bit. They were uh, wondering whether there was some sort of agricultural exemption for mowing in their wetland. And uh, I said, I didn't think there was, but I gave them a yes. copy of our um, bylaws and rules and regs and asked them if they can find one, come back to us. Uh, but they need to be informed that the least they need to do before they do anything further out there uh, other than uh, work in the area well outside the wetland is to come back at us with a delineated wetland and an RDA at the very least. Yeah. And so we need Tom, to, uh, I think we need, yep. to, need to send them a letter. Tom, why don't you work with uh, Charlotte and yep. uh, give her a little bit more of a background here? Uh, yeah. This is, you know, it, it, it sounds like it's a little more than a 48 hour issue. I know it's been talked about in the past, right. but um, I don't want to get into any deliberation here. I would encourage you to work, uh, br uh, give Charlotte a call, bring her up to speed on the issue. And if a letter needs to, and if anything, you know, informal needs to be sent out, then then work with Charlotte in, in getting the proper, you know, notification, or, or I should say information slash guidance out to the uh, to the trustees on this project. Right. You okay with that? Yep. That's exactly what okay. I wanted to do. All right. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. And, and again, Charlotte is our new full-time agent uh, as of you know four days here. Congratulations! If anybody has any questions, comments, concerns, uh, you know, give Charlotte a call or email, etc. Uh, glad to have you on board. Uh, no one more excited than me after uh, challenging times we've had in, in the past. So, we're looking forward to working with you. We all. Feel it was. Uh, yeah. I got a comment about the uh, the Q and A here. Um, there was an individual uh, uh, who did not I, I who put some comments in here in the Q and Q and A. A couple of them, uh, I think two of them were comments. One was actually a question. Uh, if they don't identify themselves by name and address, I'm not going to read into the record uh, any of the formal comments. I replied to them to please type their full name and address. If you want the comments and address, the comments addressed, and they uh, and they did not choose to do that. So unless uh, someone types into the Q and A their their name and address, I'm not going to read it into the record. Yeah, but I thought that was great that you yep. responded to him also and yeah. him to let him know that he should do that. So yeah, that's just part of the process. Anything, uh, anything outstanding uh, for, or should say, uh, any uh, anticipated issues not may reasonably anticipated within 48 hours? Jay, may I ask one question? Can we expect that legal counsel will be joining us in the future for our meetings? That is a, a good question. I see that Amy's <laughs> on here. Um, yeah, Amy. If you need me for the, um, I think for the, for the near future, yes. Yes, okay. um, if there's issues. And then, and then after that, if there's issues, I will be popping in. Um, usually people don't want to see me because they know that there's <laughs> issues. <laughs> so I actually think it's great. I think it's wonderful. Yep. Two great additions and, and two even more great additions too with new members. So that's very excited. We had a great meeting the other day um, with, with Jay. And it, so it was, I think it's going to be good. Awesome. Yeah. Jay, I expect we'll meet the yeah. two new commissioners in two weeks' time. 
Yes, that is the intention that the new uh, commissioners will be fully sworn in and will be able to, to participate and we will have seven full voting members and, wow. and one associate and we, we look forward wow. to that very much so. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Good. And, and again, we, uh, we will be resuming the uh, weekly meetings between the chair, vice chair and the uh, our new agent. And as Amy just mentioned, there may be uh, some legal counsel involvement Good. Uh, at the beginning here, moving forward, we, we welcome legal counsel involvement and uh, constructive criticism is always great. And I will regroup, uh, hopefully, when I get back to Massachusetts and sometime next week, we can have a little uh, regrouping here. I don't know if it's just my internet connection where I am, but everyone is completely frozen. I haven't seen any. I've been staring at the same nine faces here. Is can every is is, is, is it just me or is it every or is it everybody? <laughs> You poor guy. I think it's you, Jay. What's that? <laughs> Just me? Great. Mine None of off. your lips are moving. Yeah. All right. Mine would go off. Listen, if you uh, take your camera off, it, get, it gets better, I guess. I don't yeah. Know. yeah. Well, with that, if, if you're going to take your camera off, we need to just note that for the record, all these meetings, we should have our cameras on. I, I can, but you guys can't. Yeah. yeah. You guys yeah. can't. Yeah. Right. Have a good holiday, Joe. So, anyway. I have a, uh, I think I have a wild main blueberry pie waiting for me and something, a cold <laughs> beverage. So, uh, uh, J uh, motion to adjourn. Second. <laughs> uh, motion is seconded by uh, Trisha Grady. Let's do this formally. Uh, Kathy Berrigan. Kathy Berrigan, aye. Eric Eisenhower. Aye. Aye. Trisha Grady. Trisha Grady, aye. Jay Pimpare, aye. Have a great night. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Nice, nice to see you. Girl. Nice to meet you. Thank you, Thank you, Amy. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Angela and Megan. <laughs> Thank you, Angela.